Rhodium Radio No sad podcast Rhodium Radio No sad podcast In the city City of Wilmington We keep it rocking So come on shake Shake it for me Kelly Yeah Dr. Dre is in full effect And I gotta tell y'all a little something Easy E is down with us MC Ring, you know he's down with us DJ Yella is down with us Arabian Prince, you know he's down with us Tony A the Wizard is down with us JJ Fag is down with us Timmy T, you know he's down with us DJ Poo, boy, he's down with us Toddy T is Faye, they're down with us My boy Ice Cube, you know he's down with us I like to mention, so pay attention to where I'm from Compton, but the tapes are from the rhodium My name is Dre, listen while I play And by the way, I'm also down with N.W.A. Yo, Steve at the rhodium is down with us Slangin' funky tapes, it is a must We're number one, 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 one. Tony A Welcome back, everybody, to Rodeo Radio, episode 40. If you can believe that, that's 40 episodes already knocked out. Well, after this one, it'll be 40 knocked out. We started September 11, 2019. Who would have thought that 40 episodes later, my ass will still be here? But I'm still here, so you guys are still there. And I'm over here. And this is the Rodeo Mixtape Documentary. Once again, you can... Uh, uh, live stream it at drmixery.com we'll be coming out with the blu-ray soon two disc blu-ray soon okay um we actually put in our order because many of you have asked for uh the rolling mixtape cds so we're gonna press those four up again the booming bass hit six in the mix 24 7 and high c and then we're gonna re-release uh bullshit scandalous uh in effect and dope beats and after that we're gonna have about four more so we're gonna have a lot coming this year in the next couple of months okay so please stay tuned once again we are on all platforms and if you've seen the documentary i continue to encourage you to uh send in your 20 to 30 second uh video clip to rhodium radio at gmail.com okay so without further ado please allow me to introduce my next guest an awesome musician david salas como estas david salas Bien, bien. Good. Great for to have you, me, man. man. I really appreciate it. Man. Well, well, you know what? I'm glad you're here. And you know why? Why is that? Because you're amazing, homie. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to tell you why you're amazing, all right? Okay. Okay. This is our 40th episode, okay? And every time we've had an artist on here, uh, I read the comments on the story on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram, and it's always a gang of shit talkers. Mm. Fuck that dude. This dude's a lava. But... Uh, people ignore like the overwhelming positive uh, feedback that we also get okay mm -hmm. but this is the first time or second second mm -hmm. uh, second that nobody has had nothing negative to say but positive about you thanks yes <laughs> which is a, honestly which yeah. is amazing and people's right. like yes and right. you may not know this but people have actually been requesting you Oh, cool, yeah. man. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, That's see, great to hear. You know, I, I, I usually tell the audience to pretty much hold on because they, they blow me up on my DM, my inbox. Uh, get this guy, get this guy, get this, give me the whole fucking laundry list of who to get. But mm -hmm. I tell them, calm the fuck down because we're only doing two shows a week and I'm already booked like June, you know, mm -hmm. so all of those people that they're requesting are already pretty much already on, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, and I don't like to pretty much let people know who's going to be on next week until they see it on my page or yeah. whatnot. But anyways, man, how is your weekend going? It's going great, man. We're coming back from a video shoot right down the street. So this worked out perfect. Perfect. Huh? Yeah. So my wife was shooting a song called Dreamer in California. Uh huh. Uh, and we have Tex Nakamura from the band War. Okay. Uh, one of the harmonica players, not the original guy, but the one right after him. Uh, and we're blessed to have him on on and just fell in love with the scenery here in San Pedro. Oh my God, man. Just incredible. I had never been down the coast, like down there. We got married on uh, the Korean Bella Friendship, uh -huh. but we had never been down on the coast and it's just incredible. Man. Oh, it's beautiful over there. There used to be like one of the spots where back in the days we used to go get drunk, take girls down there and stuff like that. <laughs> oh. so, but there's not a lot of people there. It's not like Santa right. Monica and everything else, you know? Right, right. It's like, so, yeah. hmm. Before we get into all the music and how you grew up and what you're doing now and your wife's album coming out and some of the music you actually sent me today. Yeah. 
73 tracks. I think it was the second track. I really, really dug it. That was like some old shit, like me cruising on a fucking rainy day in the 1965 Lincoln Continental with a 40 uh -huh. ounce between my legs. Like that's like the kind of shit that I love. Yeah. That was a fucking dope song. After the interview, I'll tell you what song it was. Okay. You know, but uh, other than that, you seen any good movies lately? Ah, uh, yeah, man. We're always watching movies. Um, God, I can't remember that. <laughs> we watched some the other night. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I forgot. I, I, I yeah. watch a lot of movies. I watch a lot of documentaries. I watch a lot of TV shows. Uh, you got any favorite TV shows? Um, you know what? Not really. Uh, no. Oh well, I mean, we we, we kind of binge on a lot of Netflix stuff. We, okay. We, we actually saw something the Gabriel Fernandez story on Netflix. Have you oh, heard damn. about that? That one's heartbreaking, man. That is. That was. I mean, if you if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's uh, or get it on Netflix. It's just uh, heartbreaking eye-opening um i mean that poor kid went through so much yeah. if you don't know the back i'm sure you know, you yeah. heard of it right the backstory yeah. of it the poor kid eight-year-old kid just tortured by his parents uh and um social workers uh did nothing to yeah, help did him. nothing police yeah. the sheriffs did nothing to uh, help him. i watched a little bit more than half of it and then i couldn't no more uh, I, I couldn't watch it anymore yeah, yeah. but i'll tell you what's my some of my favorite shows to watch real quick uh to hell and back and hell's kitchen Oh, I okay. love uh, Gordon Ramsay. I, I think I'm like the Mexican version of ah. Gordon Ramsay. Though, so. Can you cook then? No, but I can talk <laughs> a lot of shit. <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> brother. So, you know what? Uh, where was David Salas raised? I was raised in Lincoln Heights, California. Okay. Um, for those who don't know, it's a little north of East LA, mm -hmm. right? Borders of LA, Boa Heights area. Is that, Actually, is that pretty much where you went to school? I uh, All my life. I went to... I went to... Um, to uh, well high school i went to well you know i went to lincoln medical magnet because mm -hmm. at one point i thought i wanted to be a doctor so they the, it was located on the campus of uh of general hospital mm -hmm. so it was right next to it and uh so i went there until they s started building a huge the bravo center which is called the bravo high school now and back when i was going there was only like 10 classrooms and my whole graduating class was only 40 people really yeah but okay. um but they allowed uh, us to play sports for other uh, schools. So I played football for Lincoln. And then the, my 11th and 12th grade, I played for Wilson, okay. which is, you know, the rivals. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what position did you play? Pre, uh, free safety and uh, wide receiver. Were you any good? Oh, and tight end. Uh, yeah, I started both ways. For real? Yeah, for real. Wow. <laughs> I, I played left out. Oh, left out? Okay. Yeah, I was left out. You left out. I was going to say that. You <laughs> left out. So, uh, uh, so now that was my next question. Did you play any sports? Now, uh, were you a smart kid? Fairly. I, mean, I had good grades. I did go to college. I did. I actually got a uh, scholarship to USC, but I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have no money <laughs> to get to get in there. So I ended up going to Cal State LA I, on a free ride. Well, you know, I got. Mm -hmm. I got in. It was close. You know. Any good. college sports? No. Oh, well, you know what? My. Uh, you can find this funny, but. My uh, freshman year, I played JV uh, tennis. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Tennis. Tennis. So you wore those high nah, white shorts. No, they were too high. They were too high. Oh, okay. <laughs> nah. All good. All good. No, I did. I did because I I lived. I grew up in Lincoln Heights. There was a tennis court literally across the street from my house. Mm -hmm. So you know, and I wasn't that good at it. In fact, I mean, you know, uh, you know, Mexican with a bunch of Asians in my team. You know, did what I could do. But the thing is, is that somehow some way i was just wanted to win and of even though i didn't have the skills or the technical uh aspect to to you know take them on i was able to get the ball back and right. frustrate them after a right. while so i ended up being the captain of the team both my 11th and uh no 10th and 11th grade year so but but tennis is a good sport man it's harder than most people think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh now let me ask you this growing up uh and, and uh if i'm correct a mexican home uh, uh, what, what, what type of music was played in, in your home as you were growing up? What would your mother, what would your father play? What, what was pretty much the atmosphere <clears throat> growing up as far as musically? Well, my my um, mom was far different from my dad. My mom was born in, in Durango. Oh, no, I'm sorry. She was, she was uh, her family's born here. She was born here, actually. But their family's from my grandparents, and most of her s older sisters are from Durango, Mexico. Uh, so she spoke re and she speaks very well. My dad is straight pocho from okay. here in Cali. 
and uh, he didn't. Um, he used to bump everything from, um, geez, like from believe it or not, Led Zeppelin to uh, some, of course Santana was a staple. He was actually pretty much all over the place, which has really, really helped me as a music producer yeah. because I was exposed to, you know, Johnny Martinez salsa to, uh, like I said, Zeppelin. Um, it was everything like jazz, avant-garde jazz. Uh, as a musician, because my father's a musician as well, uh, so he, I'm not sure if you know, but he's the founder, and my and my uncle are the founders of the group Tierra. Yes. yes. So growing up, they, my uncles actually grew, were lived in front of us. Yes. So they had their own, you know, set of music. They like yes and progressive rock. Mm -hmm. And my, my uncle Steve was into uh, a lot of R&B stuff. So there was just all kinds of music. Now, my mom was into a lot of that stuff, too. She liked, she liked Kenny Loggins. And, all right. Um, but she also liked Jose Jose and <laughs> Los Dudos Los Panchos. Yes. So it was, and then top it off with the neighbors playing LL Cool J. And, you know, everything else, it was all around everything. 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 And that's one thing about, I think, about a Chicano culture is that we have an advantage in that sense. Yes. Because... Uh, there literally was everything. It wasn't just like soul, you know. It wasn't right. just like rock. I mean, and uh, that really helped my formation as a uh, music producer. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Any brothers and sisters you grew up? I got with? one sister, and she she actually was a pretty good singer. Is a good, pretty good singer. Uh, she didn't go into that, uh -huh. but uh, she she did record some, and she helps us. She's a, she's a ringer for us whenever we need vocals at the studio. Awesome. Uh, now, growing up, any instruments you play? My uh, well, my first instrument was was guitar, but uh, in band, you know, you go to junior high, and the, the my teacher said I had lips for a trombone, hmm. and I wanted to play. What I wanted to. I, I don't know. I don't know. I wanted to play drums or sax or something cool. I had you know. You have lips for a trombone. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so I ended up playing trombone, which I didn't care for. But <laughs> can you imagine if a teacher ever told some girl, you have lips for a flute, you know? Oh, that'd be weird. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that'd be weird. Okay. So, so around, around what age would you say you started picking up instruments or playing instruments? Cause I know you're a hell of a guitar player. Okay. I was young. I was about nine, probably. Really? Yeah. Now, now let me ask you this. Uh, uh, what did you pick up first? Was it the piano? Was it the, <clears throat> you know, was it the Well, guitar? it was actually a bass. Okay. My, yeah. Because my uncle, Richard played bass, mm -hmm. and he had a uh, he had just had a bass. There was guitars lying around the house, you know. And okay. So, uh, but I took an interest in bass because bass is pretty easy, you know. It's just one string at a time. So really, that was actually my very first instrument is playing bass. And right around right after that, I got into guitar, and I stuck with the guitar mostly. Okay. And uh, that's my main instrument, but I can play bass, guitar, and keys pretty well. Now let me ask you this. Um, do you think you were a natural a musician or do you think you just <clears throat> eventually just got good? Nah, I got worked. <laughs> I worked really? at it, yeah. You, uh, you know, the, the reason why I ask that is because me being, my background being a DJ, is that I've known guys, I, I could just tell they were natural by the way they picked up their needles, by the way they touched the record. I, mm -hmm. You could just see it, that these guys are natural, they're going to be good, you know. Yeah. And then there's guys that ask a lot of questions and then eventually get good. Hmm. So that's why I ask: if, Is it the same for musicians? Is there are there musicians that just pick it up and before you know it, they just bloom? There's some. There there are some who are naturally inclined to hear notes and um, you know to emulate or copy something pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's there's guitar players like that, and I guess in that respect, I, I was you know a natural in the sense I could just copy stuff. Okay. You know, uh, I could hear it and copy it, and to this day, I could pretty much you know pick up something and. So you could play by ear. Yeah. Okay. Could kind uh, of. Uh, do you write music as well? I did in college, but it, I don't remember. Okay. You know, okay. Uh, so you know, uh, I had a friend named Stuart Wyland, Jewish guy that uh, I used to hire him for everything, and I used to hum him something, and he was left-handed, and everything was, and he would write all like the notes and everything, and then he would play it. He was he was just a natural, but he ended up moving away and never saw the dude again yeah. but now uh you're out of high school uh you get a job yet or are you just straight to college uh out of high school i went to college i went to cal state la uh i had a job uh pri in high school knocking on doors for political campaigns and trying mm. to convince them 
<laughs> to uh, vote for Alatore at the time and a bunch of uh, other city councilmen. So that was in, in high school. But then once I uh, got out of high school, I was a photographer for uh, a place called The Portrait Shop in Montebello Town Center. Mm -hmm. And then that went to, remember the glamour shots? Yeah. You dress up? <laughs> yeah. I was, yeah. I was you did that? Yeah, yeah. Huh. So just to get me through college, you know? And so, and that's kind of... But the whole time I was playing in bands. So I think from the age 14, I was in a band. Really? Uh, yeah, I was in a band hmm. with, um, I might have been 15 actually, with with uh, Eric and Billy Mondragon, and they were down with three. And these, these guys are excellent. They they do like kind of a Latin jazz okay. thing. And they're very well known with like in the that market, the uh, soft jazz or contemporary mm -hmm. uh, music. Mm -hmm. They're pretty well known, they're called Down With Three. And at, at that band, what instrument were you playing? Was you still I was playing, playing guitar, bass? Yeah. I was playing guitar. Actually. Okay. Yeah, I was okay. playing guitar, and um, so we were we weren't even supposed to be in clubs, but we were playing in clubs. I mean, we were. Hmm. I was eighteen or nineteen, and um, we we're playing all over, you know. Uh, but once I graduated, of course, shit, we we're playing like seven days a week, you know, and wow. a bunch of different clubs, nineteen, twenty. At that time, you know, you're like. This is fucking great, you know. Right. You're fucking, you're 19 or 20, playing in clubs and getting free drinks and this and that. But after a while, it's just like, man, brick house again. Don't, 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 don't. You know what I'm saying? It's just, so, so, would you say it was more of a cover band, possibly? It was. It was a cover band. Okay. It was a cover band, and we yeah. we dabbled in music, uh, uh, original music. But the thing is, I was too young. I, I wasn't a producer back then, you know. I could, we all had such different influences because at the time I was really into Latin, Latin rock, like El Chicano, Santana, Malo, you know, right. that kind of vibe. And I wanted the band to go that way. Billy and Eric were really great R&B singers. Um, so their influence is more like Stevie Wonder, who I love too. I mean, Stevie right. Wonder is incredible. Uh, but they wanted to go more R&B. And then mm -hmm. another guy wanted to do more, more just straight rock. So it's like really hard at that time to get it together as a band, you know. Now right. I could do it. Now I'm right. like, man, I oh here's what you do, you know. You get the right. river from here. Let's take a little bit and let's put it together, you know. Dope. But back Dope. then, as a kid, you're just like yelling at each other. Fuck you, you do it my <laughs> way. So now let me ask you this, because I usually usually ask rappers this, and I ask a lot of DJs this. Usually, when you do your, either your first show or you're on a big stage, for a musician. I'm thinking it might be different. Did you ever did you ever get nervous as a kid going up there with the guitar? Man, I get nervous today. Really? <laughs> yeah, I get nervous today, man. Today, this, before I go on stage, I'm a wreck. Wow. Do yeah. you take a couple of shots or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I take a shot or two, you know, just to... Once you get in the groove, you know, you're cool. But it's just getting to that point. My wife knows. I mean, she's... I mean, I'll, sometimes I'll shake. So it's... it's wow. It, yeah. You, you know, uh, one thing that I'm very, very happy for, and I didn't know that this was practice because when I was in junior high, I DJed a lot of noon dances. So uh, they, the stage was always really, really high. So everybody was always able to see me. Mm. And so I had maybe about 100 kids there dancing. And I was DJing with a turntable and a cassette deck and a big ass mixer with a round fader. And that's pretty much how I was doing it. Uh, there I knew if I screwed up, I'll be the laughing stock of school. So I knew I had to be perfect. Mm. So when I started touring, it, I, it, to me, like I had no jitters. Now, a lot of times the rappers that I was working with, many times they got uh, um, scared, uh, but more los nervios was, you know, yeah. they're like they would get really nervous. They'll either smoke or they'll drink. And one thing I never did, I never drank uh, when I DJed because my, it, for some reason my ears go. It's almost like I have to turn that shit up louder because I can't hear it. And before you know it, that motherfucker's loud because I can't hear shit because mm -hmm. I've been drinking. So I never ever drank. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Uh, when I DJ'd, and yeah. plus you never know when shit jumps off and you got to package your shit and get the fuck out of there. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> so and I'm sure you you've been through that. Oh uh, yeah. So now you know what? Sh sh share a little bit about uh, your father forming uh, the group Tierra, if you will. <clears throat> well, it was father, my, my father and my uncle. Okay. Yeah. They. they uh, this happened when I was probably one years old. Or okay. When I was born, they started Tierra in 1971. And uh, they struggled, you know, for a long time, you know, mm -hmm. up until I was about nine. Uh, they hit it big, of course, with Together. Mm -hmm. um, so for those who don't, don't know, Together, baby. So that took off, man. I mean, yeah. that, that thing went, um, I remember being in um, 
at the drive-in, my first, my dad first heard it on the radio, mm -hmm. and he was the movie ended. He turned on the car, song came on, and he thought it was a tape, and he kept going <laughs> like that to, right. to get it out, and he was like, "It's a, it's on the radio," you know. He got all excited, all right. family was excited. Shit, I, about four months later, I didn't see my dad for about seven, eight months because he, he was on the road. Every Mexican family at that time had that album. The City Nights. Yes, yeah. because, I mean, we had it as a kid. Uh, <clears throat> we saw it. And I'll be honest with you, as my family, my brothers, they were all like proud. Look, look, some Mexicans. You know, like they were proud to see that there was a group out there in Tierra, or at least a Latino group out there making noise. You yeah. know, beautiful song. Uh, um, now, uh, you said something that today's generation will probably never experience what you just said, that your dad turned on the radio and he heard the song. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I ever heard the first song I produced, I was in San Francisco. Mm. And I was in the band with uh, with High C, uh, the guy that I produced a song for. And it's an incredible feeling that you feel because I remember I did that song like three blocks down the street from here, same, same street. Mm -hmm. And I did it in my bedroom on a four track and we released it on a mixtape. And uh, after that, we ended up getting signed by one of the biggest labels in the world. You know, which mm -hmm. was uh, Disney, uh, Hollywood Records, mm -hmm. and uh, it came out, and uh, you know they signed us, and to be able to hear your song, which you only created for a Swami cassette, mm -hmm. and get signed today, you know, it's because you can load up music, put it on your Instagram, put it on your Facebook, put it on your YouTube, but to be able to turn on the radio and just happen to hear your song, it's an incredible. Thing. Oh, absolutely, man! I mean, yeah. it's a huge rush, and when they that one movie with the. the Tom Hanks, where they're, I can't remember the name of the movie, but there's a movie where they hear it, they're in like some shop and they mm -hmm. r start running and they're all, you know, they're jumping all over the place. It's, that's what it's like, you know? Yeah. Same for me. Like. I mean, when I, you know, when I first heard my work, mm -hmm. it was, a, it was on radio too. So, okay. and uh, that was with Don Abosivo. Okay. Uh, well, well, why don't you speak a little bit about, well, you know, let's, let's speak a little bit on when you got into the production side, when you pretty much got behind the board, if you will, or you got these people together and let's start recording. When did that first happen for you? <clears throat> well, I was interning at um, probably about 19 years old. I was interning at a place called Fiesta Studios in downtown LA. Okay. And they were, uh, they did mostly like Banda and Norteños and stuff like that, but they had just bought some ADATs. Um, okay. Um, so at the time I was just cleaning up, you know, just to be around music, you know, but they got ADATs and they put them in the back room and they started, um, they needed somebody to learn it. So, you know, I started reading the books and put it all together and they had an extra board there and I, you know, just kind of rigged it all together. So I was a go-to guy, you know, for that room. So I started recording there, not producing really, okay. but just, you know, recording things, you know. Uh, and then he started throwing little gigs at me here and there just for programming because I, I started a, an O&W. Um, oh, God, I forgot. the not a, Who used to make an M1? Okay. I, I forgot who was the maker of that. But yeah, I started with an O&W and uh, I started programming on that and got pretty good at it. So they started throwing me some jobs Okay. that way. Um, now, for those that may not know what a... a, a uh, a that was it's pretty much a VHS cassette. Yeah, pretty much. You know. a VHS, yeah. Did you guys have four, uh, or did you guys have three? We had uh, in that studio. We only had two. Oh wow! So yeah. it's only a sixteen track. A sixteen track. Yeah. Wow. You know, if you look at today's technology and how spoiled we are. Jeez, man. Today. People have no idea. No idea, man. <laughs> no I, idea. Okay, this is just me. People don't. You don't have to agree. You know, I think with less we created more hits, and today we have more. And I think the sound of music has gone, I don't want to use the word worse, but not as good. Well, you know, I agree. I agree to a certain extent because the thing is, is that back then, if you wanted to get um, some samples, you know, I'm talking about, you would have to use literally the floppy cards and they, you know how it was. Yeah, you, yeah. You owe, they would hold, what, 10, 15 seconds or something like that. And you have to load it, and if you want to fly it in, you have to wait for the chorus to come in and press it. You know, there was a lot of work involved in making a song. So you, once you got into it, you're emotionally attached to the song. Oops, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. You're emotionally attached to the song. You know, you were like into it big time. 
it's not like you could just start and do a new one, you know. Right. Once you got into that song, you're deep into it because you already spent all this time programming your sampler, you know, your sounds. Um, there's a lot of work back then that went into it. See, and the reason why I like those days better, because it kept people away that weren't really dedicated. You really had to learn your craft. That's true, yeah. You, you really had to learn it. Today, they just turn on the laptop, 32 tracks, whatever. And they just start a uh, drum kick, w make a fucking weird ass noise, you know, beep, 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 and then rap some, some bullshit lyrics, paint your hair a different color, take a selfie, load it up on YouTube and you can go viral. Yeah. You know, and that's where we get the mumble rap. Yeah. You know, so, no, and, and, and believe me, absolutely. I'm not hating on that, but I'm just looking at it that it's just so easy now, you know, so. But, it is, it is. And you know the thing is that they don't take the time to learn their craft um you know and that's that's a shame because i mean but it's so easy too i mean you could just you could get confused you had to go to youtube you know <laughs> that's college to tutorial today. you know yeah. yeah back then i mean i would go for the manual and look through the manual and you know right man, i'll be stuck for a whole day trying to find some shit you know you know it's funny because when i first got the sp 1200 okay that's what it was yeah the I was manual that, yeah. was about this big and i go like i ain't reading that shit that's like a phone book you know so i told steve uh, uh the guy that i based this documentary on i'll take you to dr dre's house and he'll show you how to use it me i have a photographic memory if i see you doing it mm -hmm. i'll remember because i remember he asked me you want to take notes no i said just do it show me you know uh, do it one more time and then turn it off let me turn it on and let me just emulate everything that you just did and that's how i learned mm -hmm. you know yeah uh, I, of course everybody learns different but that's pretty much how i learned i like the uh, sp12 actually more than i did the npc you oh know? okay yeah so so you were Here telling you me now you, you were an intern you learned how to use the ADATs and then eventually you began recording yeah I, be, I began recording and um I was trying to juggle you know my photo company I had a photo company at one point that I got pretty large and I was trying to juggle it but after a while I just said this is too much you know I want to go back <laughs> to music so I ended up going back to music and said no matter what happens if I starve and I did you know I was like I ain't going back to that because it's you know, I was making good money at the time. Um, like I mentioned, I, we had over 150 employees. But after a while, it was like, and I was young. I'm 22, 23, you know, just making a lot of money. But then I was really, really stressed for 23 years old. Because when you have 150 people relying on you to get work for them, you know, for the families, that's a lot of stress, you know. Yeah. So it was, uh, I mean, you're young. You're a young boy at young. that time, man. I was young, With yeah. that many people... Yeah, Fuck, that's, a, that's a lot, man. <laughs> yeah, oh, shit. Love the money, love the money. Of but, course. And I made a lot of mistakes. Let me tell you, you know, as a businessman, because you don't know shit. Right. You know, at 23, 24, I got out of. I think I got out around 24 or 25. Uh, and I said, no matter how hard it gets, I'm gonna stick with music. And um, man, I, I so I got a little spot in um, Alham Alhambra on Garfield. Okay. Uh, and that I was there for 20 something years, and. Um, I would record everything from rock and mandolin, um, I mean, uh, Chinese, rock and Chinese, to, you know, Nark Daniels, anything, just to make a living. Audio books, hmm. you know, just, just to hustle work, because I was right. like, I didn't want to go back to getting a real job, I just wanted to record. So that started, then, it, you know, I had always been programming beats, and then, um, then I got into Chicano rap, you know? Okay. And actually, uh, well, Chicano rap and Spanish rap, right around the same time. Okay. Yeah. Now, can you kick, uh, uh, we're going to be going to break in about two minutes, but can you let us know so we can get back into it after break, name some of the Spanish rap ones, and then, if you will, some of the Chicano rappers that you were working with. The well, Spanish rap, uh, La Sinfonia, El Pecador, which is part of Mex Mexican, yes. uh, uh, Crooked Stilo, David Rolas, um, La Sinfonia, uh, Don Abasivo, uh, Mal Hablado, um, Miss Crazy. On the instrument Chicano rap, um, it's everybody from Baby Bash to Lil Rob, I mean, God name it, Lil Cuete, Chino Grande, MC Magic, <laughs> um, and then other people like I've I produced Smokey Robinson, mm -hmm. Jenny Rivera, um, about three four different movies from John Singleton's Illegal Tender, um, Fast Food Nation. And I probably have over 200 music for 200 different TV shows. Dope. So, you know, it's been a fun ride. 
That's awesome. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and take a little break, and then uh, we'll come right back, and we'll pick up right where we left off. Okay. We good? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, everybody, once again, we're here with David Salas in the building. Uh, make sure you call somebody, text somebody, slap the shit out of somebody, let them know that we're in the building. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Go get yourself a beer, take a crap, but make sure you come right back. Talk to you soon. About now, Dr. Dre is in effect. Cold tan shit up my man Steve at the Rhodium Swap Meet. And we here to lay it on the line. To all them sucker niggas out there claiming our tapes and shit, we just got one thing to say. What it do, what it do, it's Mr. Little One chilling on Rhodium Radio with the one and only Tony A and John motherfucking Elkin, boy. Hey, what up? It's your boy, Mr. Shadow. You're watching Rhodium Radio with my homeboy, Tony A, the wizard. You know what time it is. Yeah, what up? This is Mr. Night Owl, and you're listening to Rhodium Radio with the legendary Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. Yo, what's cracking? Nosotros somos Aqua. Y estamos aquí con Tony A, the wizard. You know Rodium what it is. Radio, damn it. You know what it is. Yo, what up? This is Mellow Man A, the Padrino. And you tuned in to Rhodium Radio with my man Tony A. Keep it locked. Yo, what's cracking? It's your boy OG Arabian Prince from the world's most dangerous group, NWA. Sitting here with my boy Tony A, the wizard on Rhodium Radio. What's up? This is Esther Daz, the Spanish fly, Harbor Area's finest. Tune in to Tony A on Rhodium Radio. What's up, everybody? It's your homegirl, Magic Girl, and you are now listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the wizard. Yo, what's up? This is Bozo, a.k.a. Emiliano. You tune in to Rhodium Radio on Tony Vision's YouTube channel. Let's get it. What up, what up? This is Mr. Soto. You guys are now in tune to Rhodium Radio right here on Tony Vision on YouTube. Yep. Check it out. This is MC Poncho on the MIC. Shout out to Tony A, the wizard, Rhodium Radio. You already know. What up, this is DJ Trick, Spanish Fly, and you're watching Tony A on the Rhodium Radio Show. Big G, Rhodium Radio, Tony A in full effect. Stay tuned, watch, listen. This is how we doing it over here. Yo, what up? I'm out here. It's Big Daddy Swoles. I'm jamming with my man, Tony A, the wizard, out here on Rhodium Radio. The podcast is off the hook. Check us out. This is DJ Clientele, and you are listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the wizard. Yeah, 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 this baby bounce here with Tony A, the wizard. You are now tuned in to the Rhodium Radio. We do it for the people. You hear me? Mike check, Mike check. Ernie G from Proper Dos. And I'm listening to Tony A, the motherfucking wizard on Rhodium Radio. And if you don't know, you should know. What's up, everybody? This is Soren Baker. I'm the author of the book, The History of Gangster Rap, in stores now worldwide. And you're listening to Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. Make sure to check it out. We talk about the Rhodium mixtapes. We're here. Soren Baker, Rhodium Radio. Y'all, this is Reedy Gregg, and I'm chilling with Tony the Wizard on Rhodium Radio. Yo, this is Daniel Jones, the D to the motherfucking G Media Clips. Here with your boy, Tony A the Wizard, on the Rhodium Radio Show. Hey, this is Swifty Blue. I'm right here at Rhodium Radio with Tony A the Wizard. Stay tuned. It's the K.A.S. here live on Rhodium Radio with the one and only Tony Ye, the wizard. What up, y'all? This is Kiki Smooth, the first Mexican rapper out of Compton, rich and ruthless. And you're listening to the Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the grand wizard, El Mago himself. Hey, Compton's in the house. What's up? It's quite the Yes Guy with my Harbor Otter got homeboy Tony A, the wizard on Rhodium Radio. Yes, Guy. Hey, what's up, gente? It's your homeboy, Duende. 
You're tuned into Rhodium Radio with my homeboy Tony A. the Wizard. Ya te la sabes, wey. What up, what up? It's your boy Baldacci the Beast, Afro Music, the face of LA. Right here at Rhodium Radio. Make sure y'all tune in. Your boy Tony A. the Wizard. Brah. What's up? This is DJ Dominator, and you're listening to Tony A. on Rhodium Radio. This is Kelvin Anderson, owner of the world famous VIP Records, and you listen to my man Tony A. the Wizard. On Rhodium Radio. Yeah, yeah, what up? It's Lil Black, you the Brown Super Bowl, and you checking out Rhodium Radio with the homeboy Tony A. the Wizard. It was cracking at your boy OG Big Wicked, Real Ones Apparel, Orange County. I hear my boy Tony A. the Wizard. Rhodium Radio. Y'all make sure to peep it. Peace. Que tranza raza, aquí su servidor, Sinful El Pecador, and you listening to Rhodium Radio with my boy. Tony A, the wizard. Check, check. What's up? It's your boy Capital I, man, from the Mexican crew. And you're tuning in to Rhodium Radio with my boy Tony A, the wizard. Motherfucker's a legend. Bow. What's up, y'all? This is Christy Glove, and you're watching the Rhodium Radio Show on Tony Vision on YouTube. What's up? This is Mr. D on Rhodium Radio. Kicking back with the whole boy, Tony A. Yo, what's up? This is John motherfucking Elkins, and you're tuning in to Rhodium Radio with my homeboy, DJ Tony A. The Wizard. What up, West Coast and all hip-hop fans? This is your girl, Violet Brown, and I'm here with Tony A. The Wizard. And if you're rolling with us right now, that means that you love West Coast hip-hop. And if you want to know the real deal from the real players, the real people behind the scenes... You better pick up Tony's new film, Rhodium Mixtape Documixery. You get it by going to documixery.com. You better get this. And I want to do a special shout out and a rest in peace to my man, Steve Yano. I'm out. Lonzo, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You sure? Motherfucker, I'm ready, goddamn!
Welcome back, everyone, to Roading Radio, episode 40. 40 years in the wilderness, if you can believe that. Well, not necessarily 40 years, but 40 episodes. Listen, we're not going to go ahead and waste any time. We're going to go ahead and jump right back into it with David Salas. I'm going to say it, legendary producer, legendary uh, musician. <laughs> Thank okay. you. So, I you wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, I'm saying it, and uh, uh, a, a lot of other people have said that about you. You know, So there's actually a good report out there about you because... Let's be honest, there's a couple of guys out there that when you mention their name, some people will say, oh, that fucking asshole, you know? Mm. And then there's other people like yourself, that dude is cool, man. Uh-huh. So, so, so I'm oh, glad to have you here, man. man. So man. before we went to a break, you were talking about you working with Spanish groups, if you will. That's what we call them in Chicano rap, yeah. rappers. Uh, um, uh, how or who was the first one that actually approached you and said, hey, man, I want you to do some music? Um... Jeez, man, that's a hard one. Was, yeah, it usually, exactly. was it usually somebody that recommended you to, or like, getting contact yeah, with this Yeah, right, at Fiesta Studios, they had me doing little things here and there. Okay. And I was just, like, programming something real simple, you know. Uh, so that was really my first paying jobs. Okay. And that was, and I was, like, 19 years old. Uh, and, um, but when I opened my studio in, was it 24 or 23 or 24, and in, in, uh, on Garfield in Alhambra, that was, I was there for 20 something years. And it's just people, um, people that I grew to knew within the music industry. Remember I was playing in bands. Right. So I was doing bad, a lot of bands, yeah. you know? So that's another skill in itself and not just producing or programming or mm-hmm. something. I mean, recording bands is a whole nother monster, you know? Right. So uh, that, that, I think I was doing more of that actually in the, in the beginning. Okay. But, um, there's not a lot of those gigs, you know. Okay. There's far more, uh, just you know, rappers. So when the rappers started coming in, did they just say, "Hey, man, how much you charge for beats?" Yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. For sometimes they bring in their own beats. Okay. You know, and then, um, but then I just show them some beats, and then you know, and I, had, I would uh, sell them the beats, and um, okay. that's kind of how it started. But uh, I was always recording somebody, man. I was, it was just my, mm. I was fortunate to you know at the time like craigslist anything just to to get the word out that i had a little studio there you mm-hmm. know just to hustle work so i wouldn't have to go get a job you know right was, of course, of course. Like, i was recording literally anything i mean uh you know and i know what you mean by don't have to get a job because i can get it whenever the hell i want eat breakfast whenever the hell i want go to the gym read go to the museum put some music together get with my boy john start getting ready to do this and I love my life, you know. Yeah, man. honestly, I, you will never ever hear me complain. I always say this: as long as I'm not dead or in jail or in the hospital, you know, I'm blessed. You know, yeah. you will never ever hear me complain. So, um, so now, you, you know, for those that are probably wondering, those that are, were are fans of yours and that are producers or DJs, when you opened up your studio, what, what would you say you were working with? What type of equipment did you have? Well, back then I, I had eight ads. You know, okay. I did have three. <laughs> okay, so I did have three. Ads. ADATS at the time, I had a Korg or O1W. I was trying to remember the name of it. It was Korg O1W that okay. I would sequence on. Uh, SQ1, the SP1200. I had, um, I never had a, what was the other one you mentioned? MPC. The MPC. I never had MPC, surprisingly. Um, but I had a lot of other gear. I had some Akai samplers. Um, back then, you needed a lot of shit, man. You yeah. Know, you yeah. needed MIDI controllers. You needed a lot of, lot of different shit. A lot of it. chords. Yeah, a lot of chords. A lot. Of, I used yeah. to have a lot of gear. And you know, the reason why I ask you to share that is because today, again, I want our listeners to feel blessed and fortunate that today's studio sometimes is just a laptop and a keyboard. Yeah. You know, and uh, you had to invest thousands of dollars. I mean, at one point, mm-hmm. I had a little bit over thirty-five thousand dollars of equipment here in this studio, and I worked with a lot of guys. But after a while, you know, you can't charge twenty five hundred or three thousand bucks for a beat no more. Yeah. Guys come in here and they were like, you know what? Uh, how much would you give me for two hundred dollars? I'm like, dude, that's not even fucking gas money. Mm. That's when I decided to kind of get out of the music because I saw, because I, I know dudes today that charge twenty five bucks for a beat. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've never heard of leasing a beat. I don't know what that is. <laughs> that's a new thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I lease beats. And I'm like, what the hell does yeah. that mean? So, and that's her. That's her. I'll be honest. You know. Right. It did hurt me, and then uh, for a while. But I kind of, 
you know, uh, as a as I was producing, I realized a lot of guys weren't uh, collecting, particularly my father. So what happened was that my next part of going into uh, music was that my father um, wasn't making enough the money I thought he should be making. And as a producer, I knew that I was getting paid, you know, um, my royalties through BMI and other things. And uh, so when I started looking into his thing, I realized there was a lot of areas when he was not collecting. So I got him a lot of money. You know, I kind wow. of just did all the paperwork and turned it in and said, and the money started coming in from my dad. And, and then, you know, of course, arguing with people, lawyer labels, just trying to screw him over. Yeah. But, um, well, my father has a lot of peers that were in the same exact situation, the Midnighters, El Chicano, Malo, you know, his closest buds. Uh, so I did the same thing for them and that kind of just turned into a whole nother business that I have now, which is really flourishing. Um, and it's called Artist Royalty Music Services. Okay, Artist Royalty Music Services. And Music Services, Artist Royalty Music Services. Okay, and I'm glad you brought that up because I want to announce that whoever's watching, if either they want to hire you or get in contact with you or talk to you, they can reach you at your Instagram, if I'm correct. And uh, you can help them possibly look into the royalties or get the royalties. Yeah. Okay. That's very <clears throat> important because, I like what you said, there's a lot of people that have music out there and are broke as fuck and are wondering where did it all go, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, for those of you that are out there listening and ha either have a problem or have, has had songs out there and you haven't been collecting anything, get it this man. This is the man that will take care of you. <clears throat> so his Instagram is up there and, um, you know, uh, um, I'm sure you'll get back to him in a timely manner. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of money, especially these days. You know, for every stream, there's probably three or four different ways you can make money, you know, and probably even more on YouTube. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that, you know. Right. Um, and what I do is just kind of organize it for them. And my company basically gives them a, a, a company email. They see every statement coming through. They see every registration coming through. So we're completely transparent. In fact, none of the money goes to our company. It actually all goes to them. Hmm. So we rely on them to pay us once it's right. uh, once it comes through. Okay. So and one of the reasons I built it that way because people be like, "Why? Why are you crazy? You know, they're gonna fuck you over. They're never gonna pay you." Right. Oh, it's ninety-five percent of the people who pay me. Okay. Only five people. Yeah, I'm not even five people. I mean three people probably have not paid me, you know, mm. so, okay. um, so it's definitely well worth it. Uh, and, uh, it, artists, you know, they really kind of need to take that part seriously yes. because some potentially have a lot of money out there. In fact, man, there's, I have gotten over a hundred thousand for artists, uh, that had no idea that that money even existed. Right. So, wow. um, Wow. Yeah. So get at him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is that there's certain areas where you don't know a song is popping, you know, because obviously with digital age, it could be really taken off in an area you don't know. It could be taken off in fucking Turkey. Yeah. And you just don't know. But every country has their own performance rights organization that kind of holds pennies for you, a fraction of a penny. And you got to go out and get it. That's only one part of it. But the, of course, there's there's you know your publishing money which everybody just kind of like doesn't realize they got to go get um and uh you know you got harry fox music reports and a bunch of other uh companies that are just holding money for you you know right. and right. if you don't get it uh if you can't get it retroactively you could at least get it going forward you know and um some of these artists are just missing out on a lot and my company really tries to organize it for them and make sure that they're getting every penny of it awesome Awesome. You know, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever asked you, but I'm going to ask you for me that Tierra album with Together on there. Uh, um, how many did that sell? Uh, I'm sure it would go. I remember my dad getting a, uh, uh, it was like a gold record back. Gee, I, was, I was probably only about 13 or 14 back then. Okay. So I'm sure it's well over now, you know? Wow. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely say because yeah. I would have thought a record like that would have easily have gone platinum or something like that. I don't know. You know, the record company went under uh, and Boardwalk. That's when it becomes hard to find out. Yeah, exactly. It comes, okay. It's hard to find out, to trace it down, because nobody's reporting anything. The great thing about my dad, that album, actually, I managed to get it back from my dad. 
So with our company, like especially our older artists, there's a very obscure law called the 1976 Copyright Act. Hmm. And uh, after a period of 35 years or 56 years, you could apply to get your master's back. So um, I did all the paperwork and sent it to the copyright office and sent it to the uh, current owners um, and they had to release them. So as of December, uh, my dad and my uncle owned the masters to their biggest album. And wow. that's a big money maker to this day for yeah. them. So Yeah, that's awesome. You're a good son. <laughs> Tell my dad that. Uh, hey. <laughs> Tell my dad that. Yeah. So, so now, <laughs> let, let's come back to uh, some of the Chicano artists that you were working with. Okay, around what years would you say you were working with some of these guys? Um, well, it's, I mean, er, once in the early 2000s, from 2002 to, or 2003, all the way up to now. I mean, okay. I've, I've worked with, jeez, um, I, mean, I, I, I know you told me, yeah, uh, if quick. I'm correct, you mentioned Night Owl. Night Owl, Mr. Shadow, Lil Cuete, Chino Grande, I mean, pretty much everybody on Urban Kings, Midget Local, um, uh, like I said, Baby Bash and Lil Rob and um, Miss, Crazy. Miss Crazy, yeah, she was another one. Ever do anything with Aquid? Uh, I think I did one, yeah, I did one song with Aquid back in the day when they started coming mm -hmm. out. Um, you know, did, uh, did you ever help any artists get deals? Oh, yeah, La okay. Sinfonia, I signed... Uh, to Sony, Don Abusivo to Universal Latino, El Pecador to Universal Latino, uh, Malabado. But by the way, El Pecador, that album, did you do any of the production on that album? The Blue album? The, uh, I, did, I guess the one with um, where he rapped off of uh, Tragos Amargos. For yeah, him. I did that one. Really? <laughs> the whole album I did. Wow. Yeah, I did that whole album. I, I think, uh -huh. it, I want to say it was 2005. Is that when it was yeah, done? Yeah, 2005, yeah. He came over here and he sat like somewhere over here. And uh, he played it for me. And I'll be honest, I thought that shit was fucking incredible, man. You yeah. Know? You know, they, they didn't, they just didn't release it, to be honest. And here's the problem with that. You, you kind of alluded to it in a couple of our conversations that the record companies that, the people that I dealt with at Universal and Sony were either Argentinians, Cubans, or Puerto Ricans. And when they, we, we would have meetings in which they would be like, don't put in English on the song songs. Don't put it in, it's all in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, these are Chicanos, you know, they didn't, couldn't understand the concept. And right. I'm like, go look at their message boards online. I mean, nobody's, it's not all Spanish. You know, right, right, in right. fact, it was 75% English they're, they're talking, you know, or they're just going back and forth, you know, but uh, they didn't have a concept of what El Pecador and many of these guys wanted to do. And they didn't really understand the market. You know, it wasn't, it was too hard for them. And they thought, like, Aquid, when Aquid broke, you know, you put some banda music and um, it's going to fly. And it did, you know, to, to a certain degree. But it wasn't a natural coming together of, uh, of music, you know. I didn't, it, it felt very natural. You know, that one song was pretty dope, the one that hit. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I never thought that whole banda thing was moving. And obviously it wasn't because they don't do it anymore, you know. Yeah. It's just the rhythms are kind of, don't really cater to themselves for... Okay. For that, but I I am all for experimenting, you know, with a lot of different things. But it wasn't to to make something to try to make something as they did back then, as part of a movement. You know, it has to come naturally. And uh, the music executives back then were saying, "No, no, I want banda on, <laughs> banda music," right. and they were trying to make El Pecador do the same. And mm -hmm. that's why they didn't push it because I think he only did. Uh, yeah, Tragos de Margos, which is that one came out dope. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they wanted him to do more banda, from my memory. And they didn't, uh, he was like, nah, that ain't me, you know? He wanted yeah. to do Las Tericulas, sample some dope shit like that, yeah. you know? You, you know which other one that I really liked was when you guys sampled Siempre Mi Mente. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was fucking incredible, man. Juan Gabriel? Yeah, yeah. And then you guys sampled, uh, um, I guess it was a sample from Scarface. Uh, it was a little, I think it was like some flutes or something. Oh, yeah, like that. that. Da, 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 where they hang the dude. Yes, that <laughs> yeah. shit was hard, man. Scene. So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to it, and usually when I listen to a song, I'll give it about 30 seconds. If it doesn't, I'll press skip, skip. Here, I, I let play all the way through. Same same way when I first heard Aqua's first album, I mm -hmm. couldn't skip. And then I just never heard it. You know, it just never came out. And we were talking about it when I interviewed him here. But he pretty much said the same thing that you said, that 
the record label just didn't seem like they wanted to get behind it. Mm -mm. But no. th this is where I encourage our young listeners to stay in school and get an education. Let me tell you why. I, I don't want to be mean when I say this, but we don't need any more rappers. We need more thinkers. We need more people at HBO. We need more people at Showtime. We need more people at Netflix. We need more people at Sony or Interscope or whatever. Mm. So when we get there with our music or with our movies or whatnot, they open the door for us because they understand our culture. Mm. When we get people that weren't even raised in Southern California or not even Latinos, they don't understand us. A and we are the majority here. Absolutely. I I've always said we are hip hop's economy and yet we're still on the outskirts of it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a good, a good example is, you know, back in the day when 96.3 came out, they did play some of it. Mm -hmm. Some They did play some Lil Rob, MC Magic. They played a lot of La Sinfonia, who I produced. And then immediately they flipped. And then um, the thing is, they called Latino 96.3, thinking it like all Latinos are just Cubans, Puerto Ricans. Right. You know, they forget about the whole Chicano community right. that will support uh, good Chicano music, you know? I mean, there's so much that clear channel and all the conglomerates push that is just foreign to us the lingo you know um you know down south lingo or something mm -hmm. like that that hey man you put something good because there's a lot of good stuff out there man there's a lot of good stuff out there but that's just not being represented or being right. pushed out there well and um well you're I, right that's why we need our own decision makers in these jobs exactly you know uh i forgot who i interviewed and i asked them to name at least 10 10 Chicano artists, let's just say from 90 till now, 1990 till now, that had major record deals. And it, I know we can get come up with at least five, okay? Yeah. But the rest, we're now we're kind of pulling teeth. We're kind of wondering, like, who in the fuck? You said Chicano there? rap. Chicano yeah. rap. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough yeah. one. And there's a lot of good ones out there, but nobody really cares they just want to go with whatever is popular whatever is popular you know that's why i created this platform along with my team here to shine light on people that i believe are, are nobody ever talks about or nobody cares about nobody wants to mention it but there's talent there mm -hmm. you know i mean i mean one of the greatest comedians ever ever was mario moreno cantinflas mm -hmm. from mexico from mexico mm -hmm. i mean we have so much talent over there and yet we have so much talent here but nobody cares you know, and not to diss who, who I'm, I'm going to name is because I have love and respect for them. But like, they'll look at it if you're not a Snoop or if you're not a game or if you're not a DJ quick, you know, you're just not popping. Mm -hmm. That's not true. That's not true. You know, uh, uh, I said this when Ackwood is here. I said, if you take all the Mexicans out of L.A. overnight, the economy would collapse. Your favorite rapper will be working out of a warehouse. Yeah because we are the economy for them here Absolutely. and it's true we just need to start supporting ourselves so i encourage everyone to stay in school what did fernando valenzuela say be smart stay mm -hmm. in school mm -hmm. remember that commercial yeah <laughs> so That's right anyways so so now you know what um uh, what is, what is david salas working on now uh, well you know i'm i'm so thankful that throughout the years i've uh managed to keep track of um my royalties you know and I, I don't have to be producing things I don't necessarily want to. So mm -hmm. working on my wife and my, my album, oh, we're doing uh, an album together that uh, mixes some soul, some uh, old school R&B, some, you know, like Santana, Al Chicano, Latin stuff, some riffs. Oh. Um, it's like if you put Al Green, Al Chicano, and Dr. Dre in a room and said, make some music, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's kind of that flavor, you know. That's it's a dope combo right there, man. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's songs and, and music that we love, and we're really, really happy to uh, release this album probably in um, early June. Okay. And and if that, along with my company, um, uh, I'm really pushing hard. But I'm also, you know, always looking forward to to working with projects I want to work on. You know, okay. and I, I know that sounds a little messed up, but. I've afforded myself the luxury at this point, you know, right, right. that it's like, I, it, it, it does, I try to help new, new artists and I definitely want to help new artists in the sense that to help them help their business, you know, because right, right. there's no point in making, you know, all this great music unless you're collecting on it, you know, right. and there's nobody to blame but yourself right. if you're not doing it. You got to make that extra, take that extra step to really try to, uh, to see what's going on with that, you know? You know, uh, I think it was earlier this week uh, we spoke, I think it was maybe Wednesday or Thursday, 
we had spoke on um, how, well, first of all, let me say that I want to get back into production. I, I really, really do. I know that I could still come up with some dope ass music. Here's my thing. So I'm kind of like in the same boat as you are. I just don't want to work with just anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, if I see somebody that, uh, if I see gold in them, if you will, that I know is ready to take off, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll work with them, you know? Oh yeah. Um, now, one thing that I, I've always told everybody that if you're going to work with me, you got to bring your A game. Don't think you're going to come and just bullshit around and play video games and text all fucking day. I'm going to play some music and you, you're going to fucking write, even if I got to leave the room, but we got to create a chemistry or a, a vibe so we can come up with some good music, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I, the way, I, I mean, I've known rappers that have called up other rappers and said, email me a verse. I, I would never do that. You know, I would never do that. Yeah. I know that's how people do business today, <laughs> yeah. but I, I'm not going to do that. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I want to have chemistry with that person if I'm going to be producing them. Okay. Absolutely. In the past, uh, um, and if they're going to be watching, fine. Uh, um, they don't know who I'm talking about. There's guys that I know had no business rapping, mm. you know, li li seriously had no mm. business fucking rapping and, but they had money. They had money. They wanted a little bit of the limelight, mm. you know. Uh, so fuck it, I'm a rapper now. Do me some beats. Here's 10 G's, gave me five tracks. And I agreed. And I remember this guy said the word son of a bitch five times in 16 bars, you know. And I just stopped and I went, hold, hold on, T time out, pal. Uh, wait, wait, say that again? He goes, yeah, that's right, you son of a bitch, you motherfucking lame, I got the AK, you're, you're just nothing but a son of a bitch. And I was like, hold, hold on, stop, stop. And I was just like, I had a long talk with them and I just returned back his money. Now, anybody will say, fuck, I would've took 10 Gs. I love my music yeah. and I just can't do that. You know, so yeah. I don't know if you ever came across. Well, yeah, I mean, we had a little discussion on that and that is one thing that looking back in hindsight that you know probably one of my regrets is that i did record things like that and again it was just to, to not try to go get a real job i was just like hell no i'm gonna record this and suck it up and then i look back and i'm seeing some of the stuff i sang on like oh i probably shouldn't have said that you know <laughs> <laughs> but but it's the it's but it's uh um, you learned but you know you learn and um fortunately i didn't you know there's not really that much stuff right. but uh going forward you know i i really want to put a positive message out there, like you said, and have uh, people that are, um, you know, coming up in the business, like you said, try to be decision makers and change the game along with it. You know, change right. the attitude, change the game, change, let's really, we got the numbers to really take control of this yeah. whole industry. This you know? whole, this entire industry. And my thing is, why why don't we just take it over? You know, I don't mind coming out of fucking retirement and start producing beats, you know, for some people that I know really want to win and are hungry and are talented. You know, so I really want to do that. You know, I had the honor and the pleasure to sit in several studio sessions in the, in the late 80s with Dr. Dre. Mm. So I saw how he worked and I saw his attitude. He used to always say, if I don't see gold in that guy, I'm not going to work with him. He was real picky on who he was going to work with. Mm. And I understand that. And I kind of took that. And he, he would tell people, you know, you, you need to be in your fucking A game when you come to the studio with me. Mm. Don't come bullshitting. I've known guys that have blown their whole fucking budget because they wanted to hang out in the studio and play PlayStation and smoke weed all fucking day. Never dropped one damn verse. Mm. And they were blowing the $120,000, you know, uh, um, uh, budget and then ask in advance for the royalty so they could finish their album. They never took that shit serious. Yeah. So anyways, so now uh, this album that you guys have coming out, is there a title for it already? Uh, yeah. Actually, can I bring it in here? Just yeah, you know what? If you can grab a can seat. Grab a seat here. So you could, oh, <laughs> just just so she could talk a little bit more okay. about the, about the album. She has a huge part. Obviously, we co-wrote. We co-wrote all the. Uh, it's love and pain. Okay. Let me, see, let me see, bring this over here. Love and pain. Uh -huh. By the way, this is my wife, Daffy. Hola, qué pasa, raza? <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> and, go ahead. And it's really about you know what relationships are about. Okay. Love and pain. We we go through everything. Yeah. Okay. You know, of course, it's bliss for us most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> has, it been, has it been more pain or has it been more love? No, nah, it's been all love. Well, yeah, it's been all love. Sometimes, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's some pain there, and it becomes very nice to make up again, and you know. Dope. dope, dope. <laughs> and writing some music about it. <laughs> exactly. You, you know. Now let me ask you guys this: uh, How many tracks total? There's 14, I believe. 
14. 14. Well, it's, it might be it come down to 12, depending on what the final mix looks like. Okay. Yeah, but right now there's 14. We've cut some, you know, but uh, I think it's going to end up 14. Yeah. So, now, 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 being a married couple, working on an album, uh, how, how was that chemistry? Is it different when you're not in the studio? I, I mean, I, I guess since I don't know, I'm trying to understand, like... Does it become more professional? Is it still a relationship in the studio? Or uh, how does that work? Well, I use the Ike Turner method. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Get in the fucking studio. Yeah, <laughs> Get yeah. in there. Sing, bitch. bitch. Start singing. From here. <laughs> From here, <laughs> bitch. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I like Come on, that. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> There's the pain. No, <laughs> at, first, at first she was a baby about it, but. Yes, I was. He actually made me cry a few times. Okay, guys. So I know a lot of you guys are watching and have been with David before and know that he's a little bit hard, but he's made me cry too. But I, I, I I'm hard because I want them to really get the final good product. You know. You know, I thought I was the only one. No, no, no. I, no, no, I get, that. I get vested. You know, like emotionally invested in it. It's like, no, this guy's been, And anybody that's been in the studio know exactly what I I'm know. talking about. They're like, oh, shut and the fuck up. And they think he's picking on them, but I'm like, don't. He doesn't discriminate. He does the same thing to me. So don't trip. It's yeah. all good. He just wants the best product to come out right. here. He he wants to bring the best out of you. Yeah. And yeah. And, and many times, believe me, I. And I even feel bad since I work with females and I've always said, do it again, do it again. Well, just punch me in. No, do it again. And they've come out crying, mm -hmm. you know, but now when they hear it, then they understand what I wanted to bring out of them. There yeah. you go. That's so, and sometimes mm -hmm. getting that emotion up in them, you know, getting them pissed at you. We'll bring that out, yeah. that, that, that emotion out, you know, and yeah. sometimes it, that's what you got to do. Yeah. And then I just won't cook for him or do his laundry. For a day. <laughs> for a day. You can always go to Popeyes. Yeah, yeah. Go to Popeyes. Want some dinner, honey? Come on, there's the McDonald's down the street. Yeah, thank so, you for recording today. So, so this Great album session. is completely done already? Close to it. I'm okay. on the final mixes of it. We got a lot of really talent. We got the Midnighters horn section, well, who also played for Tierra uh, back in the day. Uh, we got um, Sour Jigas from War on it. Um, I'm, and course uh we're, well, we're seeing most of it uh we got jesse uh castro on bass who how used to play with Vernon estrese really good bass player and uh john martin on some drums as well it's a really incredible album i'm so proud of it um because it's a like a i say it's like a really uh it's a well thought out album you yeah. know it's it's not like we just threw in shit, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I mean, we love working together because you know he, my husband, is the best producer, makes the greatest melodies, but he's not very good at songwriting. Yeah, I can't lyrics. I can't. Man, I'll sit there and just like ah, oh, that ain't gonna work. That ain't. So so he she passes on the melody to me, and then I'm like, alright. Yeah, let's I mean, write I'll it come up. up with the melody. I'll sing oh. something, and she'll. The great thing is that she'll get it syllable for syllable. Because it's so important, you know, as a songwriter, when I mouth out just nonsense, that nonsense means something to me. Right, and right. She, can, she somehow knows what it, it means. I can't. What the word it's feels weird. like, you know? Well, see, but that, that's what makes a great relationship because she actually picks up where you leave off and yeah. vice versa. Yeah. Vice versa. So that's dope. Uh, now, uh, once again, you said around June, people can expect it? Yeah. June is called Love and Pain. Um, we'll probably the first one I think we have out is uh, you don't have to worry. We kind of just threw it out as a little teaser. Okay. Um, but we haven't really promoted, haven't shot any videos of anything yet, really. No. But we're we're gonna get it out real soon. Uh, okay. But it is all live band. Um, Music. So, yeah. yeah. All live band. So okay. this is a any club stuff in there? Not, not really. There. Not no, really. no, no, no. Not on that album. Okay. It's. I mean, there's one kind of a danceable track. Which one? <laughs> Angel Sing. Oh, well, okay, yeah, kind, kind of. Kind of. Cool. But no, this is more thought-provoking. Uh, it's, you know, like I said, it's like if you put Al Green and, you know, a Dr. Dre. The only reason I say Dr. Dre is because a lot of these new acts want to do oldie styles. Yes. But they want to make it sound old. Well, we're not trying to really make it sound old like we, we did it, you know, on an old compressor and, you know, <laughs> and anything like that. It actually sounds big. You know, we're, we, we're going after a sound that sounds today it'll yeah. hit hard in your car <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. it'll it'll shake your trunk and all that but it's uh it it's just the chord changes are something from back in the day you know okay and the melodies are, are similar to something back in the day but it's very original we combine a lot of different styles um uh, you know some songs tanish stuff 
um, and we're very proud of it. Okay. Yeah. How long have you guys been working on this? Jeez. Gosh, like a year and a half, about yeah. a year and a half. Oh, that's yeah. a good album then. That's a definitely yeah, a good about album. a year and a half. We just finished the songs first, and then my husband went and started getting all the live stuff going. Dope. Yeah. yeah. Dope. And that's why I said it's like people don't make albums like that anymore. You know, they'll do it in a week sometimes. They'll do it in a you week, know? yeah. But uh, back in the day, man, and that was, it, it took months to get an album done, you know, back in the day, because mm -hmm. we would, you know, you go in there and discuss the the concept, the feel, the soundscape, you know, what's it going to be? What kind of instruments we're going to use? Are we going to go too far this way, too far that way? There was a lot of planning involved. You right, know? right. These days, it's not that. It's no. just kind of... Boom, boom, pow. Get it out right? there. I want money now. Boom, and everything, boom, pow. Yeah, and exactly. everything takes time. Yeah, todo, 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 todo. I like. Well, here's what I'm going to do, David, because uh, uh, our time ran out. When this album drops, please come back Absolutely. and I'll interview both of you guys. We would love to. We yeah. would love to. Uh, is there, are you guys performing anywhere soon, possibly where maybe the people can see, or you guys are going to wait till the album drops? We're going to wait, but we have actually a summer tour. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing across uh, the country with the 80s, Lost 80s tour, but we're also going to try to see about getting some shows out yeah. to the different states where we're going and open up for I play music I music. play guitar for a musical youth. Okay. Remember the past, the yeah. the left. So whenever <laughs> okay. they come from England, I play with them, but we're real tight. We're like family. And yeah. uh, so we got about a 27 city tour. But he wants to pick up dates, so most of my our, our band actually is just playing for them. So our drummer, our bass player. Oh wow! So we're like, well, we're on the road. Let's you know, let's it get is. some <laughs> dates on there. So yeah. we'll be hitting a city near you. All right, whatever yeah. near you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, at this point, you want to give any shout outs? Well, you. Let me tell you, man. I want to thank you for what you're doing, man. It's uh, incredible. You know, I I took some time to really look at the videos and. I love the way you're doing it. I love the way you're empowering Chicanos. It's super important. You know, uh, we're on the same page on a lot of different things. And I want to give a shout out to this guy. Give him a big hand. He's important. He's important to what he's doing. And uh, just, of course, to my lovely wife. Mm -hmm. and, and to the mm, woman who produced the producer. Oh, mom. <laughs> the real producer, <laughs> mom. Oh, and, oh. Yeah, my dad will talk. <laughs> but uh, my sister and uh, all my artists that I work with, I especially want to thank them for allowing me to make uh their music you know because oh, i wouldn't be sitting here because exactly. <laughs> i don't rap you know right. so, true. to lucky everybody you. i work with. i don't want to you guys. i don't want to say the name because everybody's gonna say oh give me the tell you say about me you know so i mean everybody <laughs> yes. a todos. Yeah. all right my brother thank you very much right. god bless thank, thank you, so you. Much. god bless we'll see you soon yes yes Okay, everybody, once again, we ran out of time, but uh, they will be back when their album drops. Okay, you have my word on that. So once again, go get yourself a beer, uh, 10 minutes break, call somebody, take somebody, break a bottle over somebody's head, let them know that Fancy the Boss is in the building. And we'll be back in 10 minutes. And we heard about this young kid from the hardware area named Tony A. And he was a DJ, you know what I'm saying? He was going in with, with, the big, with the big stars, you know what I'm saying? And he was like, one of us, going in and infiltrating inside of all these MCs, you know what I'm saying? A Rodian mixtape is just mixed of different types of music, no matter what genre it is. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's like, a, like making your own musical movie. When La Raza came out, man, I just, even the amount of sales of the single of La Raza that got moved out of the Rodium was, it was crazy, bro. And that song just got played and was played in all the stands over there. And, I was blessed to go back one time, even to see it, and I want to say in 91 or 92. Although they were not black, they were Oriental, Asian, whatever you want to call them, they, they were cool. And they embraced everybody, blacks, Latinos, whoever came to the, came to the swap meet to want to buy music, they were record people. Yeah, what up? This is Mr. Night Owl, and I'm chilling right here with John motherfucking Elkins. Beware, motherfuckers, because we coming.
Y.C. and Tony A. Chilling at the rodeo with my homeboy Steve. Be on the lookout for our new 12 inch. The shit is dope. Yo, I like to say what's up to my homeboy Dre, my homeboy Prince of Jazz, and the girls with the big ol' ass. So trip, I'm about to bust one more time to let y'all niggas know just what's on my mind. Six in the morning, police at my door. Fresh to be this week across my bathroom floor. Out my back window, I make my escape. Didn't even get a chance to grab my old school tape. Mad with no music, but happy cause free. And the street to a player is the place to be. Got a knot in my pocket. Stupid dope shit by WA. You wanna spray? Dumb motherfuckers, no doubt. And suck a DJ. Get the fuck out, Tony. Hey. What did you say your name? What did you say your name? Tony. Hey. I have won one million battles. Lights, cameras, action, sound. Give me that mic, I'm a fucking go down. I'm thinking of a master plan. I know you guys are waiting. Without further ado, fancy the boss. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad you could make it. Thank you. Um, how's the weekend going so far? It's going good. You know, it's going. Yeah. Spend a little time with my little one. Your little one. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. And uh, you, you are you usually go out like Fridays and Saturdays? Um, I work most of the time uh -huh. on music and. I stay stuck reading and writing and just playing beats and working and working on music. That's all I do. That'll work. Pretty That'll much. Work. I asked uh, David Salas, has he seen any good movies lately? Have you seen anything good? Um, you know what? I really don't watch TV. For real? Uh, for real. Like, i rather bump music and study my music. And then, like, when I have a chance, maybe like an hour of, like, a documentary on rap. Mm -hmm. You know what I come to find out? People that usually do not watch TV have a big ass 75 inch Sony TV in their living room. You know, <laughs> that, 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 that's kind of like me. Like, uh, I buy a lot of movies. Uh -huh. Okay. I buy a lot of Blu rays. And um, every once in a while, I'll like throw one on with my brother or whatever. I know his ass is watching. But we'll watch a scary ass movie, Insidious, or What Fright Night, or some goofy ass movie like Ed Wood. We'll watch something dumb like that to entertain us. Or I'll have like my favorite TV shows, like what I said, uh, To Hell and Back, Hell's Kitchen. But I, I, I don't really watch a lot of it. Uh, watch a lot of sports. You watch any sports? Sometimes. Maybe uh, if the Lakers are on, I'll watch. Of course. Of course. Yeah, but... Rest in peace, Kobe. You, you, I know. You, you I gotta say, Kobe. Yeah, you got to say rest in Man. peace, Kobe, every time you mention the Lakers. That really hurt. Yeah. I'm like, it really hurt. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. felt that. You, you know, it's funny because... Um, uh, he played what about 20 years right. and i always tell people he kind of became like part of our family because we grew up watching him right you know he, he was in our home on our tvs you know if you will but uh yeah that was that was uh, that really hurt now um let's get into the the fun part of the interview okay. where, where are you originally from or where were you raised at i'm from linwood okay linwood, california um uh, i was born in bellflower but i was raised okay. in Linwood my whole life and i'm still there Okay. I moved to Vegas for a few years, but uh -huh. that didn't work out. I had to come <laughs> back to L.A. Everything is just so different out there. Right. You, you, know? you moved to a lost wages. That's yeah, really right. right. <laughs> now, um, living out there in Las Vegas, did you adjust to the weather? You know what? I kept getting sick. 
Really? I kept like a cold, flu, fever, you name it. And like every two weeks, I just couldn't adjust. Yeah. It's nothing like Cali weather. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, at a young age, I, I had, uh, I was blessed to have traveled a lot, you know. Right. But I swear to you, you know how sometimes they show the Pope when he lands and he, he kisses the ground every time he lands. I felt that every time I landed at LAX <laughs> because there's nothing like Cali. There's right. nothing like, especially LA. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I, I'd be in some sandstorms or some fucking tornadoes or it'd be too fucking hot in Arizona. Exactly. And as soon as you land back in LA, you're like heaven. It's heaven. Yeah. You know? I know people say you, you pay too much. Uh, California's too much. I don't give a shit. We're paying for weather. You know, we're paying for weather and I love it out here. So, I mean, I remember one time I took my family. We were in, uh, I think it was like Thanksgiving or Christmas and we were at the beach. <laughs> Dope. You know what I'm saying? Well, my friend's up in New York freezing his balls off, you know. But. <laughs> so you come back to, uh, for, you leave uh, Lost Wages to L.A. Uh, or Linwood, I should say. Yeah. And um, what, what, what elementary school did you attend? I went to Wilson Elementary in Linwood. Okay. And, and I then, went to Linwood High. Linwood High. And then I kept getting in trouble, so I started going to Downey High. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was back to home studies because I started working. Hmm. My grandparents got tired of it, and they were like, you're going to have to start working, girl. Like, so that's what you were raised with? Yeah, they raised me. Like, my mom back and forth, but, like, my grandparents are the ones that raised me. Okay, Los Abuelitos. Much. Yeah. That's dope. That's dope. And uh, now... Um, I'm gonna ask you, uh, being raised as a as a young girl with your grandparents, so what type of music did they did they play? Well, they played like a lot of oldies, like a lot of old music. Like my grandpa's a big war fan. Okay. Like Tierra, he's right. into um, a lot of Santana. Um, hmm. My grandma plays like the Intruders and you know stuff like that. Um, a lot of Barbara Mason. Okay. Yeah, okay. my mom. Now, when I would get in the car with her, it was Little Kim. It was Easy E. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my aunt bought me the. Um, what did she buy me? She bought me the Resurrection album when I was nine. Oh. So no. <laughs> that's how, what really got me to start rapping, like right. the Resurrection album. I would like. It was funny. I would just like write the words in my notebook that right. I would hear from, from Bone Thugs. <laughs> dope, dope, dope. If I can ask, uh, when you speak, uh, can you speak a little bit closer to the mic? Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. just a little bit closer. Uh, so that's pretty much what you say you started, but just pretty much just writing down what they were saying. Yeah. You know? And I would just like mimic what they were saying. Like right. it was crazy. And then I would listen a little Kim at nine. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sorry, mom. Uh, but yeah, like that's what really got me to start like wanting to rap at nine years old wow it wow. was a shocker because i was um singing since i was five okay i've been singing i started singing in church okay so, yeah i was about to say what do you what inspired that but you say church that's, yeah church okay. and that's how i felt like music was my calling because at a young age like my grandma would just like sign me up to sing for the church Oh, okay. Like, so I started singing for the church, but then, like, I drifted away from church, and then uh -huh. I just started, like, rapping and writing and singing okay. my okay. own stuff. Now, you said at five, pretty much your mom say, hey, I can tell her. she's going to sing, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, did they give you the songs pretty much to sing, like, sing Hallelujah or something? Yeah, they would, like, my grandma would be like, I want you to sing this song. Practice this song, and then that's how um, it would come about. <laughs> were, you, were you a pretty good singer at five? Um... I mean, it's a lot of developing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that. Like, I wasn't the perfect singer at five years old. Right. It's a lot of developing. Yeah. As you, your voice cracks a lot. You hear it as you keep going through the years. It cracks. Then it gets better as you take voice lessons. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you play any instruments growing up? Oh, no. No. Nothing? You uh -huh. were never interested in, since you were in church, let me try the piano and the organ. You the know what? I can't read music. Like, it's just not for me. Okay. I could write music. I'd rather let the producers do it. Okay. I, okay. I'm just not an instrument person. You, you know, one thing that I would encourage you to do, because this was with me, I was more of the lazy producer when I first started. <laughs> I, I knew that I couldn't read music. Mm -hmm. I try to take classes to learn, but I did not have the patience 
to learn how to read what's this, okay? Mm -hmm. What's middle C, you know? Uh, I didn't, but what I wanted to do, here's how I wanted to learn, and I encourage you to do the same thing, and I'll tell you why. Uh, um, watch somebody that knows how to play. You know, somebody that may just do some basic shit. Right. Ask them, put my hands where you started. What did you do next? And then from there, you'll start hearing what you want to hear. Okay, this is there. Okay, what about, let me try this here. Before you know, you start producing and developing your own skills to produce your own music. Right. The reason why I'm saying this is because now you don't ever want to depend 100% on a producer. You don't. Because most producers will keep you waiting on purpose. On purpose. Sometimes even if it's even if you're throwing money at them, they want to keep you on purpose. Because here's what a lot of people, and I, I know I'm throwing some producers under the bus because I know they've done this. Uh, no, she's going to call me. I'm not going to call her ass. You know, and they want you to keep on, you know what, learn your own craft. You know, start doing your own shit. Even if it's uh, something small. From the very, but after a while, shit, you may go to him and say, listen, all I want you to do is put it together. I have this sound that I, I like, that I played. I mean, I know how to play 100%, but this is kind of what I want. And that's how I started. I knew how to play certain sounds, even if it's like, dun, dun, ksh, ksh, dun, dun, ksh. and then he would like, okay, then I kind of hear this. We kind of came up with it together, you know, right. even if it's something that small, so. Buy yourself a little keyboard whenever you get a chance. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, don't get too lazy on your own career. No, Remember that's that. true. Okay. I just like, I don't have the patience. I've Me tried either. it and I just. Me neither. <laughs> I, I, I like to tell, I like to hum something to somebody and have them play it. Okay. But now when it comes to working, uh, doing the drum machine, come sampling and cutting and scratching, I, I could do that shit. I don't need nobody for that. But if I ever want to play like a live bass, live guitar, some piano or what, some Fender Rhodes, then I have to hire somebody. Okay? Right. But now, um, so you sang in church. Are you playing any, any sports in school? No, I never really played sports. It's always been singing, dancing. I've always been a dancer. Okay. I've been a, I did um, flocorico, okay. ballet, hip hop. You know, drill team, the little cheerleading, um, Polynesian dance. I've done it all. So you were attracted to dancing? As yeah, well. dancing, like performing, dancing, mm -hmm. singing, rapping. Okay. Now, out of high school, you're out of high school now. What do you do next? So I started going to a community college and I did get my degree in pharmacy tech. Okay. But that just, I went to work as a pharmacy tech and they don't pay anything <laughs> they don't pay nothing you could work at kaiser write it it doesn't matter like i'm sorry to throw pharmacy techs under the bus but they don't make nothing right the right. pharmacists are the ones that make the dough yeah well one thing i know for sure teachers school teachers don't really make much either yeah. probably some of the most underpaid people here probably say in the united states you know they have to deal with kids they have to deal with parents you know growing up um it's funny because whenever i would bring home a letter like tell my mom, look, I was a bad boy. Right away, she'll tell me, you know, what the fuck did you do? You know, <laughs> it was always me. What did you do? And nowadays, when the kid brings home a letter, it's always that fucking teacher. That's the way the parents see it today. Right. You know, and a lot of times we just need to kind of step back and like evaluate the situation. Okay, cool. Because believe me, I have a lot of experience in that. Uh, um, now, you uh, told me that you had the resurrection at nine years old, okay? And uh, you started mimicking, started writing. Were you able to understand the lyrics? Yes, I did. Really? I used to put my, um, you know, a Walkman. I would put the little earphones on and study Bone Thugs in Harmony. And really? then I loved it because I wanted to rap and then the singing and I would hear their harmonies, like how they would do it. Uh -huh. So then I started studying them and then I just started writing my own stuff at 12. Wow. Well, like nothing good, you know, nothing lyrical yet. But it was a start. Yeah, it was a start. It pushed me into And as okay. I started going to school and doing a lot of reading, I started learning big words. Mm -hmm. And then I started reading the dictionary, studying the dictionary. And then that's where the lyrical. Well, you began to implement yes. that in the lyrics. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so would you say that you credited Bone Thugs? for, if you will, encourage you, inspire you to rap? Most definitely Bone Thugs, uh, okay. Tupac for sure. Uh -huh. And um, 
I would say the greatest is Bone Thugs. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I listen to a lot of Mariah Carey. I okay. just, those three, uh -huh. like really inspired me. What, what was it about? I, I know it's pretty much self-explanatory, but what do you think it was about Tupac that really attracted you to him as far as his music? Um, Cause I'm from that side of town. I'm from Linwood, the next city over. So right. like I could relate, like, you know, my mama was the single mom on welfare, like right. just a lot of things. Like he came from the ghetto. He was a straight gold mine. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know he was from Baltimore too, but then he came to Compton and, you right. know, just a lot of things I could relate to. Right, right. Like seeing my mama struggle, he's seen his mama struggle. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just seen a lot of things growing up and that's where Tupac, and then also one of my aunties, she always bumped Tupac with her little blunt in her car <laughs> and with me in it. <laughs> so that, you know, that just everything about Tupac I could relate to. Wow. Just from love stories that he would put, like, with his relationships to, you know, mm -hmm. just life in general. So, so you know, uh, uh, I only, I met Tupac once. I seen him one other time. He was 19 years old when I met him in Oakland, 1992. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I seen him one other time. I think, I want to say it was probably, shoot, maybe a couple of months before he actually, uh, uh, you know, he deceased, you know. Yeah. And I saw him at a club. And I didn't walk up to him because by that time, he had so much people around him, you know. Mm -hmm. It's sad because I often think that if people like Easy, people like Tupac, and people like Biggie would never have passed, music possibly would have never have changed wh where it's at today. Uh, now, I, I know you're younger than me. So when I say I talk about this music today that I don't really like, this is what I mean. Uh, uh, I seen hip hop pretty much from the very beginning, and I always saw it climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. And I will say, within the, till the last five years, I seen uh, uh, the music downgrade, in my opinion, and I seen even rapping uh, downgrade. Uh, I almost felt like there's no really no lyrical skill today. Um, now, my son sometimes would say, "Oh, Dad, you're just hating on so and so." And, Here's what I say. It's not that. It's just that I love hip hop. I just don't like the state of hip hop today. That's right. it. That's all. I know music changes. I, I know it does. I just don't like it this time around right now. But now, does that mean that I don't wish these artists well? No. Get your money. I, I want them to win. Uh, it's just very hard for me to get into it today. You know. Okay. Uh, now, let me ask you before we go any, <coughs> any further. Who would you say, if any, are some of the uh, rappers that are out today... Uh, possibly on the radio, if any, that you listen to? Mm, I don't really listen to much on the radio right now. Mm -hmm. But I am a Cardi B fan. Okay. I am a Nicki Minaj fan. Um, as for male rappers, mm -hmm. I mean, if I want to dance, it's pretty much like Migos and a little bit of, I don't know, maybe... <sighs> J. Cole. Okay. J. Cole's dope. He's okay. actually very lyrical and Yeah. Yeah. See, and I can I can bump that. Yeah. You know. See. You know, I can bump that. So today when I see guys uh you know, with today's music is just very, very hard for me to get into. Right. I just don't think much went into it. That's why when David Salas and his wife said their album took about a year, year and a half, because there has to be chemistry there. Right. And a lot of times guys today will say well look you know uh here's the beat you know here's the beat here's the beat tell me which one you like here's the beat i'll be honest with you i never had beats lying, lying around like that i never did back then producers would mostly tell you uh, what what is out there right now that you like you know and let's just say you say i like tupac okay which which one specific oh, i like this one this one this one this one so now to kind of get an, an idea of what you like what kind of artist you are and maybe what type of direction to take you in as far as music mm -hmm. is concerned that's how you begin to to, to build a, a, a get a vibe and chemistry for the person that you're producing right and then uh, um uh, i would produce maybe half a beat and ask you do you like the way it's going yeah i like the way it's going okay we continue now you got a full dope solid song you write three verses, you get a couple of choruses, we got one down. Once we get about 
maybe within six, seven months time, we got about 14 songs. Let's pick the best 10, okay? Go from there. You know, that's the way we used to do it then. Now we start shopping it, you know? So I'd rather much work like that than do it be overnight and sell it for 30 bucks. Right. And it might be the hottest song on Instagram for about a month, but it's not going to last the test of time. So do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Okay. Certainly. Okay. So um, now well, why out of all people, Mickey Minaj and, and um, uh, Cardi B? Uh, Cardi, I can relate to her. Just a lot of things she says in her music. Um, and Nikki, I can relate to like uh -huh. how she comes in delivery. Okay. Like she attacks the beat. She she kills every song she does. Right. I'm sorry. Like every song she does, she, it slaps. Like okay. she's out there. Okay. Like her delivery, her mic presence, the, the way she right. comes out. Right. Okay. Like she could sing, she could rap, like she does it all. And I've also heard Cardi too. Like she could sing a little bit and she, you know, her raps are dope. You know, the mm -hmm. Bodak Yellow was one of my favorites by her. Mm -hmm. But you know. Um, I say Nikki though because she's more of a lyrical rapper like myself so okay. I could feel like I don't know I just relate to Nikki a little bit more that'll work that'll work and uh, 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 now you know what since you said Linwood and next door to Compton were you still around when the Compton Indoor was, around, was open? yes it was heartbreaking when they shut it down <laughs> I live actually two blocks from there now really? it's a whole Walmart yeah so <laughs> It's a whole Walmart, and I just don't shop there because it's super ghetto. But <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny. It seems like, well, I can't say that because I went to one Walmart that looked so fucking elaborate. <laughs> it was like up north, like by Calabasas out there oh. somewhere. You know, but it seems like every fucking Walmart is like, yeah, you know what I mean. No, it's it's something else. Like, yeah, but um, every time I go there, it's just super packed, so I don't even shop there right, anymore. Right, right. Uh, uh, I grew up going to the Compton Indoor, and the reason why I bring that up is because uh, one of my buddies that lives in Harlem, New York, mm -hmm. when he came down here, I want to say 2005, 2006, uh, I took him to Compton Indoor. That was one of the things that he wanted to see. I got to go to the Compton Indoor. A lot of people that live here don't realize that for some people, that's like almost like a historical hip-hop monument, if you will. It is. You know, it you know, is. That... Just like uh, I had a, a gentleman here by the name of Calvin Anderson, the owner of VIP Records from Long Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing. His store, that's where Snoop Dogg filmed his video, uh, What's My Name? They filmed it on top of his store. That's another historical monument. It's no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, I was telling my friend, you know, like KB Stores is gone. Toys R Us is gone. I know I'm getting old. If they ever close down, Best Buy. Because that's like <laughs> one of my favorite stores. Okay. So, because uh, um, I still like to buy movies, I still like to buy CDs every once in a while. Yeah. So, so now, um, now you're rapping. Now, we're gonna get into a little bit more about your career after uh, the break. But I wanted to ask you, when you first took the mic and started rapping, uh, do you remember when that was? Did you, uh, as far as in front of an audience, or maybe in front of a family member, or whatnot? Do you in front of a a big crowd or it could be even a small crowd um well i always sing in front of an audience since i was five so okay so you, you were know. somewhat used to it already. yeah but the rapping part i remember doing my first show when i was about 19. okay and it was at the green turtle in mm -hmm. whittier okay and um i was invited by um the management of Midget Local. Okay. So I was invited and um, I was just so nervous. Like, I just, I don't even know how I did it. Like, my voice was cracking on the mic and everything, <laughs> you know. But, you know, I just, I pulled through, you know. Right. I just put my glasses on and acted like nobody was there. But, yeah, yeah. You know. Now, now uh, uh, you said you were nervous. Did you remember your lyrics? I did. But okay. I had the lyrics playing in the background, so I wouldn't sound so. Oh, okay, like you, the ad libs. Yeah. You know. Okay. The okay. ad libs. And now, uh, how was the response? I mean, I got the crowd jumping. Really? Like most of the time when I do a show, I do get the crowd jumping. I try to make them feel comfortable with me, so they don't feel like, "What is she gonna do on stage?" You know, like, "Who is she?" Right. You know, so I start talking to the crowd and <laughs> <laughs> start, right. you know. 
building that energy right just to get them hype that'll work that'll work yeah. and uh those lyrics that you rap were the lyrics that you wrote yeah i write all my stuff so you don't have like no ghost writers like no. low key uh-uh so so five years from now when you blow the hell up somebody's not going to come out on tmz and say i wrote all her oh shit. no i write my own stuff and i actually register all my stuff on online at registry.com okay i register all my lyrics because it's me it's my right. writing and Okay. I just feel like that's gold right there. Okay. Did, did you ever want to, uh, uh, I mean, what, do you plan to do singing in your songs as well or just rap? I do both. I okay. sing and I rap. I'm actually working on like an R&B mixtape right now. Okay. Um, my EP and the album, I'm probably going to push it to the end of the year. But um, mixtape and EP, that's what I'm doing right now. There's a lot of singing. There's a lot of rapping. Okay. Mostly rapping. Okay. But like icing my own hooks and everything. Okay, okay. It's always good, and I always tell this to uh, mostly guys that are start barely starting off. Have a plan. Right. Have a plan. Make yourself a date. That doesn't matter by this time, this year, or it's going to be done. It's going to be out. So now you got to go or feel you got a target to hit. Uh, when we started this podcast, I told my boy John, I said. We're gonna start September 11th. This was two months prior. I don't give a fuck, we're gonna be ready. So we gotta do whatever we can do to be ready. So uh, make sure you, uh, if you will, uh, make some dates so that you can meet them. You know what I'm saying? Once you fulfill a goal, make another one and strive to, you know, and this is a message to people that just wanna be in the music industry, period. Make yourself a goal, give yourself a date and accomplish it by that time. Make yourself another one. Because there's a lot of people, believe it or not, that I've, um, how would you say, I've talked to. And they're just like, oh, I just want to fucking, just want to rap. And they, they don't even know if they're coming or going. You don't, you don't ever want to do that. No. You want, you want to be very, very uh, uh, business minded, if you will. Right. O always, always. Because uh, one thing that uh, a guy named Jerry Heller, uh, Easy E's NWA's manager at the time, Always said it's show and it's business. Always know the business part. Always be about your business. So if there's anything that I could pass on to you is be about your shit. Be on top of your shit. Don't always expect somebody to be looking out for you or I got so-and-so on lock. He's going to be doing my beats because believe me, there's producers that can see you shine. Well, she's dependent on me. I ain't going to do shit for her. Have multiple numbers of different people that you can go to. Don't ever put your eggs all in one basket. Okay. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. No. Sometimes I just... So, anyways, listen, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Okay. We're going to come back. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about your music, about your EP, if you have any possible dates. I know you mentioned uh, um, later on this year you're going to be dropping something. Yeah. Uh, I want to want to talk about videos. I want to talk about where Fancy the Boss came from. Okay. If you had any other names before that, so I'll give you time to think. Okay. So, once again, everybody... Uh, as a matter of fact, I feel like drinking a beer, so I'm going to go pop up in the beer. We're going to take a 10-minute break, call, to, call somebody, text somebody, and let them know that Fancy the Boss is in the motherfucking building, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. So make sure you'll be back. Testing one, two, one, two. Right about now, Easy E and Dr. Dre's in the motherfucking house. Times are getting crazy. It's really hard to choose it. The Rhodium's a spot to get funky fresh music easy Motherfucking E and my homeboy Dr. Dre MC Ren is in effect and you know we don't play The Rhodium is hitting but you know you can't leave Until you get a deaf ass tape from Steve Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Yeah man all the way down to the rodeo swap beat, man, to pick up one of the N.W.A. tapes, man. And I talked to homeboy Steve down there, man, and he said, I'm fresh out of tapes, man. How the fuck you fresh out of tapes, man? He said, because they sounded like hot cakes and shit, man. Got my man going down. Hey, mom, man, like, the N.W.A. and Easy e music hit the rodeo swap meet mixtapes first. Like, when we dropped our records, man, it was like, it was cool putting your records out, but even though people knew who Dre was and I was and Cube and Yella before, they didn't really know who Easy was. 
but not until, you know, Boys in the Hood and some of that, you know, Fat Girl and L.A. is the place that stuff hit the mixtapes, man. That's what kind of put it out there for people to know, like, what is this Easy e What is this N.W.A. thing? So I think it was like a big, big push. The Rhodium Swap Meet uh, mixtapes had a huge impact on, on hip hop and the hip hop culture because it was different and, um, you know, wasn't nobody doing it like that. You know, you had New York that was doing mixtapes, but, you know, you had N.W.A. who was saying whatever the fuck they wanted to say. Motherfuckers wasn't doing that shit, speaking how they wanted to speak, you know, and what that did was, was open up a, a lane for, uh, what they call gangster rap today and, and the hip hop culture. And uh, it really, it really opened up lanes for, for, you know, pretty much for the West Coast gangster shit to get out. And uh, nobody else was doing that. And it was just different. And, and people were scared to say what, the, what they wanted to say. And, uh, you know, that buzz came from Steve at the Rodeo Swap Meet, you know, uh, working with Dre and Easy and, and created a, a whole plethora of good music <laughs> uh, and, and it created a lot of uh, lanes and opened up a lot of lanes from artists like myself to be able to come out. You know, I'm, I'm part of the, uh, the the tree. I'm a branch on the tree that, that Dre and Easy started. You know, and then on my branch, you got Snoop, the Dog Pound, uh, 50 Cent, Eminem, and all of those guys. You know, that that's all on my branch, the chronic. And uh, that's what it created, man. One, two, one, two. Right about now, Easy E and Dr. Dre's in the motherfucking house. 
hoes Times are getting crazy, it's really hard to choose it The Rhodium's a spot to get funky fresh music Easy motherfucking E and my homeboy Dr. Dre MC Ren is in effect and you know we don't play the rhodium is hitting, but you know you can't leave Until you get a deaf ass tape from Steve Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Yeah man, I came all the way down to the rhodium swap beat man To pick up one of them W.A. tapes man And I talked to homeboy Steve down there man And he said I'm fresh out of tapes man Tony, drop that. What face? I bet. My name is the Crofts, the C R A W F O R D, the poet high C. Tony ain't the one that just is cool as a lizard. Thinking out of time, stabbing pussy like a lizard. Ooh, so sorry, homie, I didn't mean to say that. Steve is in the house. Come on, watch her play that funky dope beat. You know you gotta throw me some stylish ass crop coming straight from the rodeo. You are now about to witness Tony H. Get funky. Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio episode 40. I never would have thought I would be seeing 40. Uh, I thought maybe I'd be seeing like 10, and we're done, and we're out. Yes, do But episode 40 was still here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, when I first started this, I only had 230 subscribers September uh, 11, 2019. Now I have over uh, 13,000. I actually met my goal. I was trying to hit 10K by February, but I ended up going over, a little bit over four, uh, 13. So I encourage you guys to encourage other people to subscribe, to comment, to share, to whatever. I don't care if you guys comment a bunch of bullshit, but just comment, okay? Uh, uh, so once again, I want to encourage everybody to encourage someone to subscribe. I want to make this uh, the biggest hip-hop podcast on the West Coast, if not from coast to coast, but that's only wishful thinking. So I need your guys' help. But without further ado, please allow me to introduce once again, Fancy the Boss. You know what's funny when I say fancy? Tell mm-hmm. a little story. My son, he's 20 now, but he was like five years old. Mm -hmm. And one time I told all my kids, come on, we're going to go eat. We're going to go have dinner. He ran and got two pair of shoes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he goes, is it nice or fancy? (laughs) That's what he said. You know, all depending on what it was going to be like. But it's funny because now all he does want to eat at fancy restaurants, you know. So so now uh, when you first started rapping, was that your first thought of fancy the ball sore no that wasn't even name? my name <laughs> so when i first started um it was when i was about 17 i started recording mm-hmm. um with an ex-boyfriend's friend okay and they started calling me smiley they're like you're always smiling we're just gonna call you smiley okay. and that name just did not sit well with me i was like smiley okay fine whatever i'll run with it for a little while (laughs) so we started doing it and i was like that name's not gonna grab attention right i just knew so i started thinking and thinking and then um he started calling me he's like baby you're always dressing fancy and i was like what he's like yeah like just call yourself fancy and then the boss came later Right. When I became my own boss. <laughs> you're bossy. Yeah, you're bossy yeah. and you're dressed fancy. You have, right? right. So that, it just sat well with me. Yeah, not, <laughs> nice or fancy. <laughs> Dope. So now, you, you know, it's funny that you mentioned at that time mm-hmm. uh, your boyfriend's friends. Right. You work with them, okay. Ex-boyfriend. Right. <laughs> okay, ex. Let's make that clear, guys. Yeah. Okay, the reason why I say that is this. In... I want to say in the mid '90s, I began to work with a lot of Chicano rap artists. Right. Okay. Uh, they didn't necessarily mean that they were doing the Orale Cubo Oye Mija type of rap. They were just Chicano Chicanos that were rapping. Okay. Right. And uh, I started to meet a lot of females that wanted to uh, start rapping, mm-hmm. and here's where I couldn't work with them 
they would bring their boyfriends to the studio for some reason they would see that they, either it was just me or a bunch of guys there mm -hmm. no babe you're not gonna work and i never had the opportunity to work with a lot of females because a lot of females had jealous boyfriends mm. okay believe me i get it i respect that but sometimes you kind of just have to step aside and let her work let her uh uh be herself you know uh there was a girl that uh, was a singer she sounded a lot like tina marie and we wanted to work with her but every time i'd be doing a beat or something her boyfriend would be like behind my back every time i'd go into vocal vocal room the vocal room would be in a different part of the studio and i would go over there mic her up give her a headphone stand right here put the microphone right here do not back up stay right here okay he would follow us and it got so fucking annoying that i just told him dude you don't have to come and he didn't like the way i approached him so she never came back mm -hmm. so believe me uh, uh don't ever let anybody whether guy or female uh stand in the middle of what you want to do yeah okay? yeah and i know sometimes it's tough being a female it is know? it is you know? and you know what i've learned that if um a man cannot you know take what you have that comes with this then you got to cut that person loose Mm -hmm. They can't go with you. Not everybody could go with you when you're moving in your career. And that's what I noticed. I've cut ties with certain people because I noticed their energy. They didn't want me moving forward or me even right. succeeding in this. No, it's like true. Doing shows. Th or this is my team right here. I could count them with one hand and have one finger left over. Okay. And sometimes you have to get yourself a team that believes in you. There's not going to be none of that negative energy or that hating shit going on. Right. You know, uh, there's a quote that I read that it said, um, I can't be friends with somebody who sees me as competition. And it's true. It's true. And, and it's true. You can't do that, you know. And as you move forward, you're going to have to lay some people along by the wayside because they don't, a lot of people don't want to see you succeed. They'll tell you that, but they don't. They and then, really don't. And then, then there's, there's those few that have nothing to gain, but they believe in you. Right. You know. So, so now, Fancy the Boss is born when you're a teenager, if I'm correct, the name, if you will. Okay, uh, immediately, did you start working with producers or were you rapping to instrumental songs? How did that work? How, how did you get your groove going? Um, so, I was doing a lot of instrumental songs. Okay. Um, we had somebody on our team at the time, his name was Force, and he actually did my $100 bill um, beat. And mm -hmm. I paid him for it. But um, he used to do all our beats. Like, he's dope. He <coughs> sings. He produces. He does it all. So was that your first song, would you say? Yeah, $100 Bill was one of my first ones by myself. Okay. Um, we used to work as a team, and there was a bunch of us. But we were, like, more on, like, the... I was Chicano rap, like, right. Cholo rap. That's what started me. Right. I'm not even going to front, you know? A lot of people are... are um, so how can i say embarrassed to be boxed in but okay. i don't care like that's how i started right and then i started growing and you know now i'm i'm versatile right but um to make a long story short i mean i just had a bunch of like oldies instrumentals and uh -huh. then i started buying my own stuff okay. and coming into my own okay what, what what do you think encouraged you like were you just that serious about your career that you just said fuck it i'm just gonna spend my own money hey, boy, yeah. do me a beat yeah i mean even working at like little low budget jobs like carl's jr i worked at chuck e cheese i worked everywhere uh -huh. like you know and i would invest and invest and make my money and then um buy beats record at people's in people's garages you know, that's where mm -hmm. I started in um, my homie Demon's garage. Right. With a bunch of guys. I was the only girl. So, and like yourself, you know, I had that problem where guys, their girlfriends, did ju they just, no, she can't come. Like, I don't want her here. Right. Like, it got to that point, And I was like, hey, I don't want your man. You right. know, I just, I just want to work. Right. And then, like, I cut ties with them, started coming into my own. And then, you know, I just started doing my own thing by myself. See, that jealous, je jealousy shit, it ruins relationships. Like, like possible uh, uh, musical, if you will, future relationships because somebody thinks, you know, uh, she wants my man or, you know, 
my man might find her attractive or some bullshit. If he can't keep his fucking pants off, then maybe, you know, uh, you should. Let him lose. Like, yeah. if I see my man looking at somebody else, I mean, then he's not for me. Right. Exactly. Just right. cut him loose. Like, if he has eyes for somebody else, then bye. <laughs> Feel me? And then you know what happens when they see you winning, they'll come back. Yeah. Te quiero. <laughs> you know how it is. No, right. <laughs> so your first single comes out, if you will, and do you distribute it yourself? Uh, uh, um, how do people? How did people hear it at that time? Did you? Were you just handing it out? Um, I kept hundred dollar bill hidden for five years. Okay. I hid it for a long time because I wanted it to be a single. Okay. And I wanted to uh, distribute it the right way, so mm -hmm. I start. Um, I didn't really have a lot of knowledge in the game at first. Right, right. I had to study that, like how to get um, everything distributed through ASCAP and oh. then put everything on iTunes and, right. you know, look into the royalties and how right. everything works, how to get paid, right. actually get paid for this. Right. You know, uh, if, if you don't have it already, David Salas is a good guy to, to talk to. Okay. So let's just say for an example, you do an EP as you say you're working on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you want to, if you will, um, um, what do you call it, that word, where you want to um, certify your songs, like you, you want to make sure that you release them, nobody else can pick them up and say they're mine, you know, you have legal paperwork done, uh, um, he's somebody that could possibly uh, help you with that too, and then when it starts taking off, whether it's on all platforms or whether it's on YouTube or whatever, whatever, he can help you possibly if you're looking into that and if you don't have somebody already. So uh, that's, and that's why I, I wanted him to speak on a little bit of that because there's a lot of people that don't know the business side of it, you know, right. and believe it or not, they're doing what they love, but they're getting fucked, exactly. you know? So, so now you held on to that single. Uh, how did you like that song? I like it. It's lyrical. The uh -huh. hook is my favorite part because it's just like, dun, dun, like in the beginning, it's just me like dropping bar after bar. Mm -hmm. And um, that's actually the song where I really put my lyrics to work. I oh. just wanted that song. It's called Hundred Dollar Bill. Like I'm married to the man on the Hundred Dollar Bill. I don't know if you heard it. No, 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 um, no. I know what you're talking about. But yeah, it's just um, something that I just, I was single at the time. And mm -hmm. I just like, that's my man. Like <laughs> Ben Frank never does me wrong. So. <laughs> no, no. I mean, believe me, every time I, uh, um, any be somebody, I do my homework on them right. uh, weeks in advance. Like my Wednesday guy coming in, already got my homework, already got my questions, and they're all right here. Okay, so I heard a lot of your stuff. Well, the stuff that was available, I was able to hear, and some of the stuff that you have on uh, your Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I like your voice. Thank I really you. do. Uh, I will say this, and I hope you don't hate me for it, but always be open when somebody tells you that. Um, be open for improvement. It's not a bad thing. It's actually constructive criticism. You know, now if somebody can say, well, who the fuck are you? You don't even rap. You're right. I don't even rap. But I've been around a lot of dope rappers. And I know sometimes what I want to hear from an artist, you know. So always be open. And was, if somebody ever tells you that, then say, okay, then how can I be better? You know, how can I be better? If somebody's going to criticize, at least they should be able to give you that answer. How can you be, you know, better? So, um, but I, I do think that uh, you have a dope voice. Thank you. Uh, um, I I just think, my opinion, from what little I heard, okay, uh, you need some doper beats. So I'm not trying to disrespect anybody who might have done the tracks, you know, but I do think that you uh, maybe ought to try a different different styles, if you will. Because, you, you, you know, you just never know. Like, for an example, you, I, know, I know you're familiar with Pitbull, okay? Mm -hmm. Pitbull was a totally different rapper before he started doing that dance stuff. Then he found this niche and he blew the fuck up, you know? A lot of times, we could be stuck on this is me, this is me, this is me, and here comes somebody along. Rap to this beat. No, I don't like it. Well, just try it. And then he fucking blows the fuck up. So I'm trying to say, be open-minded about stuff like that. Oh, yeah, so, certainly. So so now, a uh, uh, $100 bill, okay? What, what came next after you? After that. Um, after that song, I just started rapping over other instrumentals. Um, I know I did a freestyle to She's on Fire. That's actually my mixtape. Mm -hmm. I did a, a long freestyle with that. It was, uh, I think, like three minutes long. 
Really? Yeah, nonstop, just freestyling. In the so you're a pretty good freestylist? Uh, sometimes. I'm more of a songwriter, but okay. I can freestyle. That's good. You know, I've known rappers that can freestyle but can't write a song. And then I've known people that can write a song but can't freestyle. And I guess you're able to do somewhat both. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Um, it's... Um, what producers are you working with right now, as far as um, um right now for your EP? the EP is John Henry, my boy John Henry. Shout out to him. Um, and I work a lot with Talent mm -hmm. and Beats by Talent. He has some really dope beats. Um, okay. he's the one who did No Man on My Watch. I don't know if you heard that mm -hmm. one. Yes. Yeah, he produced that one. That's actually my baby right now. Dope, so, dope. Yeah. Now, um, as far as, uh, so are you going to stick just to these two guys for this EP or? Um, for the EP, it's all John. It's all John Henry. But as far as my mixtape, um, you'll hear talent and you'll hear John on there. Okay. Um, is there, now I, I ask questions from a fan's perspective, mm -hmm. uh, meaning like, I may know, but I'm going to ask you as if I don't know, uh, any uh if you will features that you've done on other people's stuff um i did a song with my boy monstro i uh -huh. did the table of bosses i was actually his feature um as for other features i really don't collaborate with too many people mm -hmm. i'm very i pick and choose who i want to work with That's and good. just for the reason just to protect my career okay. and so i'm not boxed into like a certain genre okay Okay, and on your EP, are you going to have any features? I said I would do one because I'm actually doing this EP for John, but um, it, it's going to be dope, but uh -huh. it's just something that's pulling me out of my comfort zone. Why is that? Because it's a different style. It's more of like a hip hop, like okay. underground hip hop type of okay. feel. Okay. okay. And I'm not headed for that way. But <laughs> it's just something that I'm doing. So I'm just trying different styles. I'm just playing with my style right now. Well, that's dope. That, that shows that you're open. Yeah, well. very open. And like you said, there's always room for improvement. Absolutely. And I take that as good criticism because I like that. Like, because right. I know I can be better. Okay. I know I'm not like the, like the baddest bitch in the game right now, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> No, so so now, uh, um, are you active as far as doing shows, or are you pretty much just? Oh waiting? yeah. Okay. I'm um, actually doing um, a photo shoot with Echoes World in April. Okay. And um, I just did a show on Valentine's Day. Um, How did that go? That one was good. It was nice. Mm -hmm. um, that was a nice little crowd. And then I did one with my you, boys you, in. You know who bragged about you on your Valentine's Day? Uh, oh. Um, my boy right here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, he didn't know that I had already heard of your music, you know. Oh. Uh, uh, of course, you know, it, a lot of people throw me stuff. There's people that say, um, I rap, uh, here's my music, and they flood my fucking DM with about, you know, 10 songs. And I'll be honest with you, I get angry, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I, I announce it here, do not DM me your music, I don't click on links. Okay, do not inbox me your music. It, I don't want to see your videos. Please do as I say and send it to rodingradio at gmail.com. There on a couple of, uh, usually like uh, Thursdays or Tuesdays and Thursdays or whatever, we'll get together and we'll listen. And then from there, we'll choose and we'll get to, back to everyone. I can't interview every single person. Right. You know, uh, there's times that uh, people will send me one song. What do you think? Dude, what am I going to talk to you about one song? Uh, you know, I, I get it, but have a little bit more. You know, I have a little bit more, but, um, yeah, my boy right here, he, uh, bragged a lot about you. And I had a couple of guys that sometimes they'll send me like videos and check hunger out, you know, check hunger. And one of them just happened to be yours. Oh, uh, wow. I, I want to say maybe a couple of months back. And then, uh, but I wasn't sure cause it wasn't on your page. Oh, okay. I guess like somebody either reposted it or they filmed it themselves or something. Oh, yeah. But and I was watching, I was like, damn, who's this? Because I'm always interested in interviewing females. Mm -hmm. I, I really uh, want to help push females to the forefront. Oh, because thank you. I truly believe that in the past, females, and believe me, uh, I'm not trying to sound, if you will, uh, d disrespectful, but I've seen females get dicked. Okay. 
that's the best way I could put it, financially and physically, and nothing ever happened. Right. You know, so if I can help what you're doing by uh, bringing you back on this platform whenever your EP comes out to promote it, then I want to do that. Oh, you know, thank you. I want to do that. And for all the other females that are listening, I want to help you too, you know. But just have at least a couple of more than just one song, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Some, at least something for me to work with that I can sit here and talk to you about, you know. So uh, once again, rodeoradio at gmail.com. Please send me all your music. I, I do not click on links. I do not. So I won't even listen to them. Uh, but now, so uh, you're working with different producers. You're doing a little bit more on the hip-hop side on this EP. Uh, what, what, what does Fancy the Boss want to do? What kind of music do you want to do? I'm headed for the mainstream. Okay. But um, I know I need that West Coast mainstream sound. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to really bring that back. Okay. You know, and I heard like Megan the Stallion, she redid the Tupac. But mm -hmm. she did it like she'd rather be a B I T C H, but I'm not trying to be nobody's bitch. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but she she killed it, you know. She she did that shit. Like mm -hmm. I salute her for that. Um, I actually salute all the female rappers right. because not every female can just get up and start rhyming. I know. Like you hear a lot of singers, but you're not gonna hear a female rap. Like, so right now, I'm putting together a cypher, actually, with a bunch of girls on it. I don't care if she's whack, she's dope, whatever. I just want a gang of females that can actually rap, rap on this cypher with me and shine with me. Dope. Like, yeah. I'm more of a woman empowerer like, like. than a like hater, that. you know? Yeah, you know what? And, and let me say this to people that are watching. There's no room in this game for hate. No. You know, I usually tell people that hate. Don't hate, it makes you look bad. It does. You know, it, it's, it's true. You know what? E even if you think that guy or that girl is fucking whack, bro, you know, who gives a shit what you think? You know, here's what I always say. There's a market for everything. There's a market for everything. Um, I, I've heard rappers that I did not think they were that good. I never told them that, but I would always say, I hope you win. And they won because there was a market for their music. And sometimes I wonder, fuck, there's still time for me to learn. You know, I'm, I'm still learning this shit. But uh, uh, if I hear somebody and I may not like their stuff, you know what? Oh, well, you know, maybe somebody will. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe somebody will develop the talent that they have within them and bring it out of them and they'll win, you know? So uh, let me know whenever that comes to fruition and you got it, a date set, and let me know we'll promote it here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we'll promote it here, get the word out. I know we got people watching now. Uh, we built a platform for things like this for things like this. At least now you know that you have a place where you can come, you can call me, text me, DM me, or whatever, say, hey, you know what, we got the cypher jumping off. Do you mind if I come on your show and promote it? Yeah, I'll make some time for you. Come on through, let people know. You know what I'm saying? We have the technology right now, why not use it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I I could be a hater and say, no, why the fuck would I want to hate you? Break bread. Exactly. Well, why? You know, so I want to help my people. Me too. So, and my plan is to kick down the door for a bunch of people and put a lot of people on. Yeah. There's there's room for everybody in this game and I don't think a lot of people understand that. Right. And like when I start getting hate from certain people, I don't understand. Like, yeah. I'm not even up like where right. I want to be. And, right. You know? And you know the sad part is sometimes it comes from our own people. It, yeah. You know? And it's it's sad because we got to back each other up. We're yeah. in this game together. We're trying to do something for the Latino community, you know? Yeah. Like, and then hate starts coming in. <laughs> Snakes start, you know, trying yes. to bite your style and shit. Like, you know? Yes, exactly. I'm just trying to do something positive. So do you have a date, uh, a possible date for this EP? For the EP, it's going to be late April. Okay. I have to actually talk to John about setting the date he wants i know it's gonna be in april like that's okay. the set time for the mixtape i would say sometime in um maybe may okay like later in may and okay. then that album i'll be dropping that like probably december okay and then going into the new year if i do decide to ever come out of retirement and start doing some beats i'll let you know Thank you. and we do some west coast shit oh yeah for sure you know, i'm all west, west coast. coast like that's my style dope dope now uh if people wanted to hear anything from Fancy the Boss right now, do you have a platform right now where people can actually listen to some of your music? Yeah, they could go on iTunes, um, Spotify, YouTube. I'm everywhere. 
Okay. I'm on all platforms. So. Okay. The reason, and I know that, but the reason why I asked that because sometimes you get these dickheads. They there's no music out on her. Well, you didn't look. Right. You know that's why I and I had to ask because so that way people can go search you and check you out and look you up and, and give you a listen. Yeah, I don't give them everything though. Of course. I kind of just want to keep them guessing so they want more. Right. Of course. You know. Uh, sometimes less is more. Yeah, less is more because. Then they're going to get tired of you. Like, damn, I keep hearing this bitch everywhere. <laughs> you feel me? Like, you got to just, like, let it be. Let it flow. Let okay. It flow. Okay. Uh, um, any producers out there that maybe you may not know that you would say, I would love to fuck with that guy. I would love to work with him. Anybody out there? It could be a couple of them. Yeah. Dr. Dre, of course. Of course, right. Um, DJ Khaled. I love the whole positive Mm -hmm. um vibe he has okay. he's worked with like big artists jay-z okay. somebody else okay um i just want somebody that's gonna put me on my a game like you said like Dope. bring that a game Dope. to somebody that'll tell me like hey that sounds like shit yeah, like get working. back in there Knock it out. and do something better girl right because i know you got it in you like i want somebody like that behind my like in my ear sometimes the boss needs to be told what to do yeah like sometimes the boss just needs that little push to be the boss like okay i'm gonna fuck it up right here like yeah <laughs> like i didn't want to sing and my manager erica's like bitch you better sing i know you mm -hmm. can sing when i did the toxic song she was like you better sing i was like oh i don't want to sing she's like sing uh -huh. And I was running on four hours of sleep because I had did a show with my friends and the artist. Okay. It was an opening for my boy Yogi. He just dropped his EP. Uh -huh. So I was running on four hours of sleep. I did back to back to shows. Like I did one on Friday for Valentine's Day. And then the 15th, I did another one for Sin the Artist. And um, I went to the studio the next day on Sunday and I was just so tired. I had to put my glasses on. I just looked like shit the whole day. But um, I didn't want to sing. And right. I was like, my voice is going to crack because I'm tired. Like, I just want to go to sleep. But then, I don't know, something good came out of that song. And it just, it just, so it just went. The guy sang the hook, the guy that I have on there. My Shout out to my boy, um, Infinite TGM. Wow. He, um, he actually sang the hook for me. But then I put like a little bridge. It's pretty hmm. dope. Okay, okay. Now, uh, let me ask you a question. Chicano rappers, what Chicano rappers do you, do you bump? Mm, Chicano rappers. I really don't anymore, but I know in junior high, I used to love Miss Crazy. Okay. Just like a lot of her little heartbreak stuff, like her um, homegirl female oldies. I used to bump her. Mm -hmm. um, Chicano rap, I really like, well... I would say Midget Loco is a good one. Um, you know, just a few of my friends, Gangster Rick, Travi So Sick. I bump their shit sometimes. Okay, that'll work, that'll work. Uh, you performing anywhere soon? Not yet. Um, I have to get everything booked. But okay. yeah, my manager actually, she schedules all my, okay. all my shows. Okay, good, good. Well, big ups to her. Yeah, big ups so. to Erica. That'll work. Okay, now, so uh, late April, you said uh, the EP, mm -hmm. and then after that, the mixtape. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, um, remember what I said. Uh, set dates and shoot for those goals. After you after you accomplish that goal, set another one. So that way you always have something to aim at. Like, I got to finish this. I got to finish this. Don't just like, oh, whatever happens, happens. Don't ever go into it like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, other than that, at this point, any shout outs you want to give, you know? Right now is the time. I gave everybody shout outs, but shout out to um, my son for sure because he motivates me to, you know, get out here and do my thing. Shout out to you for having me. This is my first interview I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> Rodeo Radio exclusive. Yeah, Rodeo Radio. Hello. And then shout out to Erica, you know, for being my backbone through all this. You know, she actually believed in me when she first heard me and she still believes in me now and she knows what I, where I'm going for. and we got a lot of planning to do, but, you know, we're getting shit done. And um, shout out to homie right here, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 81, because, you know, for, you know, helping me get on here. And shout out to my family. Shout out to everybody I'm working with, Talent, John Henry, uh, Jokes Loves Life. I have a beautiful song that I, work, that I did with him. It's called Love of My Life. We're actually singing on there and rapping on there. 
Um, shout out to everybody working with me. I can't name everybody because I'm doing a lot behind the scene, but shout out to everybody I'm working with. I love you all. Thank oh. you for all your support. Thank you for everybody that wished me good luck on my um, interview today, too. <laughs> <laughs> so were you nervous? I was. For real? Yeah. I think I was nervous like episode one, episode two, because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have ever have anything written down. Like right here, just pretty much my timer. Oh. Okay? So mm -hmm. a lot of times people see me touch it because the dimmer is going, you know, so. Okay. But yeah, I don't, I, all my questions just whatever in you your know. head yeah in my mm -hmm. head so once again thank you very much for coming thank you oh, for to your thank manager you. thank you for the photographer for mm -hmm. being here uh much respect to dave salas and his wife daffy mm -hmm. uh once again let me give my shout outs once again my shout out goes out to fancy the boss thank i wish you. her luck with her ep uh her mixtape and uh once again if i come out of retirement uh i'll make some music with her um I'd like to thank my boy John Motherfucking Elkins because without him this shit wouldn't be possible. Also like to thank my boy DG Daniel uh DG Media Clips. You can find them on Instagram, but John Motherfucking Elkins, make sure you follow him, tag him, pray for him. Uh uh, <laughs> you know. I'm still trying to find him a good woman. So if you guys are interested, make sure you guys follow him. Uh my boy Alex Cervantes, fix any motherfucking car. Hit him up on Instagram. What's your Instagram again? Uh 81. 81. I, I don't know, 80, yeah, 80, spell it out. Don't just put 8-1, spell it out. So once again, the Rolling Mixery Dr. Mixery, you can find that at DrMixery.com. Uh, 88 Booming Bass, 86 in the Mix, High C, and 24-7 will be out soon. And I got four more coming out. I got Bullshit, I got Scanless, I got um, Dope Beats in effect, also being pressed up, and I have four more coming. So I know that uh, I said that I, I would have them out, but they will be out within the next month or two. Uh, but when you have a three-man team, it's pretty tough. Fucking, you know, sometimes it's a two-man team. So my special guest that I am going to have Wednesday, you are not going to want to miss it. This is a different genre. A genre, if I'm correct, started in 2013. You're not going to want to miss it. The only uh, uh, hint that I'll give you is this. And this person will be here on Wednesday, 7 o'clock. So make sure you call somebody, text somebody, and tell them to stop bullshitting and subscribe. <laughs> Y'all have a blessed night, and we'll talk Wednesday.